7 we are starting at 7 okay okay Yeah, server will come five minutes before seven. <laughs> He's a busy man. Busy. It's good to know so many enthusiastic. I, at my age, I can call all of you young, but uh, you are passionate about what they are doing. It's a great thing for ENT. And ENT has been spreading like, uh, you know, in tentacles here, there, everywhere. It's not a, you know, other specialties have gone deeper and deeper. We've gone here, there, everywhere. And we are having, uh, I mean, close to world class in many of these sub-segments. Our uh, phonosurgeons are very good. Our, uh, um, our sleep people are very good. Uh, skull base, of course, I think they can give a match to anybody in the world now. Um, Excellent work. And now people are also into facial maxillary, uh, the cosmetic work, really expanding like mad. But it's a very difficult uh, choice for youngsters to decide what to do. Because you have to have basic ENT experience, but before that they're tempted to get into one area, which may not be very good, but unfortunately that's the way the world goes. Sir, with all the new, uh, these uh, branches coming up the, and uh, the webinars and all the co conferences in, in particularly uh, selective conferences are happening. So they, <laughs> the very uh, new generation, they are very much quite confused. They want to learn everything, but they, they are still, they don't know where to go. So... Uh, whenever someone asks, I, tend, I just told, tell them, do whatever you uh, practice, whatever you comes to you. You will obviously de de develop your passion after four to five years, not before that you are going to develop anything. The unfortunate part is we don't have a good residency system. If we had yes. a good residency system, by that time they will know what is happening. So now what happens, yes. young doctors have to look for sustenance, money. Yes, sir. They have to chase their dreams and they've got to go to a good place where they can learn because the first five years after post-graduation is where you start thinking without the pressure of the exams. Yes. And you build your personality at that time, not before yes. that. Yeah. About the, who is Sumit Kelkar again? Sumit Kelkar, we think. We don't know from our but team. We don't accept him. Given the Zoom thing to again. Ah. Uh, next only doctor doctor deepa and doctor vidya sagar will be joining in our this uh, exactly, exactly. panel apart from that no one no, no one else is uh, supposed to join today oh, and, uh, sumitra may join and okay. arpit may join and i am, I am the regular dress passer and, and, and <laughs> no sir you are raman sir, you are raman the sir. Main resource person sir raman sir we are very much happy but in a small place from um, Guwahati, so four days till today, the four days walks off in a airway. And Fantastic, it is. Yeah, it's very good. It's value yeah, more than value for money. Why do you think I'm sitting here and listening? To all this very nice, and uh, it's been very well structured. I must tell you, uh, from basics uh, to you know whatever is doing, and you've really advanced uh, since uh, you know we met first time. Really advanced. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I know how difficult it is to advance because we've been struggling for years. That's why I'm appreciating what you're doing. So you can remove also. There's an option called remove. No, nobody has joined actually. Hmm. Komal Modi, I have removed already. Hmm. No, no, no. Because, Hi, who know the people? Nah, 
দেখা নপালে তার আগতে জয়েন করেছিল হ্যালো থিরু ডক্টর বিশ্বজিৎ ইউ আর মিউটেড ইউ আর মিউটেড প্লিজ আনমিউট ইয়ারসেলফ ইস ইয়া গুড ইভনিং গুড ইভনিং অল আই এম ওয়েলকাম গুড ইভনিং টুডে ইউ আর ইন কোর টিম We have seen your no, you are, you are, you are doing a wonderful job. I know I've been attending all the, the um, uh, talk um, from day one. So yeah, yeah. You're doing a fantastic job. So uh, we'll, we'll keep going. So the, the important part uh, here is, you know, it never happened um, in such a way that uh, you have started like a, uh, uh, like a, you know, unified airway thing from basic to uh, complicated uh, airway. It's a full course, like, you know, one week course so uh, luckily you got the time now and uh, you got uh, uh, the you know uh, uh, all the uh, infrastructure and uh, facilities with you so you made use of it and uh, ultimately you. ultimately the, the you know the youngsters will get benefited thank you so much and we also you know we we, lo- we also learn from each other yeah yeah your comments were very good you were giving comments yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are not generally guests with a gamusa hi the customer in assam society i want to i want to take gamusa for you have a look we we gen- <laughs> have a look oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's fantastic yeah excellent excellent you know i for- forgot that you <laughs> know after seeing this photo you know i remember this it's a gamusa from our side <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. an honor from our side no no it's an honor for me <laughs> <laughs> excellent and you know my, my good friend arpit is also there uh, uh, you are looking smart yeah uh, <laughs> yeah but you you are stealing the show you look you know more matured and looking like a professor ha ha everybody is senior চেন্নাই পিডিয়াট্রিক হসপিটাল উইথ ডক্টর বিজয় শেখরান ইজ অলসো Apollo Children's Hospital recently. But he, Vijay Sekhan is with uh, Mohan Commission. No, no, no. He is not with Mohan Commission. He is, he is in Child Stress Hospital. Kanji Kamakwadi oh, yes. Child Stress Hospital. Vijay Sekhan is a pediatrician who came in the first... Yes, sir. You, you are confusing with Vijay Krishnan. Vijay Krishnan, yes. Ah, yeah, yeah. Not Vijay Krishnan, Vijay Sekhan. Vijay Sekhan. Vijay Sekhan. Who popularized bronchoscopy in India. So, you know, everywhere he was the person who popularized. Yes. Yes. Arpit, Arpit, good, good evening. Hi, hi, Mr. Hi, Arpit. Hi, Thiru. Uh, hi, sir. Fitting I have Thiru. already, good evening. Good evening, I have already Gamusa for uh, Thiru. So, I'm, I, again, I'm sharing the same Gamusa for you also. Have a look. Gamusa, it is a, it is a towel we gave, actually. Oh. Sir, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. Sanchita. Okay, Sanchita. Yes, sir. Vidya Sagar is in. So, Dr. Vidya Sagar is in. So, we can start any time. Okay, so, Dr. S- uh, Sanchita. Not yes, sir. Uh, is- sir, Dr. Gautam. Dr. Yeah. Gautam, I just want to take one minute uh, 
Dr. Sanchita. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm telling Sanchita. I'm no. telling you. Uh, Sanchita. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Arun will take one minute from Sanofi's side. So, when you oh. announce, you, you will write. Yeah. Uh, you want to say a welcome note? Yeah, I just want to say welcome. Okay, fine. No problem. Good evening. Good evening, Dia. Hello, sir. Uh, hi, hi, Tiru. Hi, sir. Good evening. Sir, sir. Privilege. Sir, Raman, sir. Hi, hi, hi. Hello. Raman, sir. Dr. Gautam, uh, Dr. Dr. Pukhan, sir, you are looking very smart today. Pukhan, sir. <laughs> no, I am good. I, no, in, in, in lockdown, my colorful shirt, I cannot wear. I was sitting at home. Today, I have wear one of my colorful shirts. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me for this, I guess, to learning no, no, course. No, no, you are always welcome. I know about you everything. Thank you. Your DNA Thank you. students tell me, no? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Satish, Balaji and everyone talking about Thank you. Thank you, sir. They yes, put in the South Zone also, South Zone group today. Sure, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think today there is a parallel session by Satish Jain ah. going on. Yeah, yes, yes. Satish Jain. Therefore, all have gone there. So, I think there will be a little bit of uh, to, less crowd. Yes. That too with the neurosurgeons. Or neco yes. And that, everything. Yeah. Yoma, that, our pediatrician is speaking on hemangioma, so we will have some pediatric uh, colleagues also joining in. Yeah, that's good. Because we, it's a joint platform, no? With anesthesia and pediatrics. So, yes, sir. Yes, sir. But today's topic is CP angle, and it's not everybody's cup of tea. That is true. That is true. That may bring us more uh, delegates to our. <laughs> yes. Yes, and otology is bread and butter. It will. So true. ENT is expanding so much that many cups of tea is not our belong to us. Some of them you have to leave behind. Yes. <laughs> yes. Very difficult. But I have to honestly admit that. I have learned most uh, within this past three days of our meet uh, with the pediatric care wave. It is uh, wow, thank too you. much of learning. Really, really appreciate it. Very Excellent humble. work. Been very Excellent humble. work. I'm so honored to be a part of it. We are happy so to have you. for all of us. No, sir, you are uh, no. somewhere there. <laughs> we are all trying to. Nothing. Uh, Very nice. the step by step, you know. <laughs> In fact, they have structured the whole thing so nicely. Very yeah. nice, sir. Very nice. The and whole thing of taking you meet people around is that we don't get embarrassed. <laughs> the whole nice. thing great people along with us is that we don't feel, fall into an embarrassing situation. <laughs> Excellent work. I would have been very proud of myself if I was doing what you were doing. All the cases, the theoretical aspects. Fabulous. Very nice. And I'm actually very jealous of you because your clinical load is going to be phenomenal in that place. <laughs> so it's time. I think we can start off. Hello? Yes, How, sir. Please go ahead. Okay. A very good evening to all respected delegates assembled here. I, Dr. Sanchita Kalita, on behalf of GVSB Group and Pediatric Airway Center Pratiksha, would like to welcome you all on the day four of this live instructional web series on pediatric airway. May I now request uh, Mr. Arun Sobham to speak a few words from Sanofi side. Thank you, Dr. Sanchita Kalita. Uh, very good evening to all the doctors here in this panel, as well as doctors who are watching us live. I am Arun and representing Sanofi, working as the area manager in Guwahati. First, I would like to thank uh, GVSB Group and Airway Center Pratiksha for allowing Sanofi to be associated in this innovative and power-packed airway web series and workshop. Sanofi always believes in spearheading in dissemination of the scientific information and uh, updates, in to, which helps you in making an informed decision in treating your patient. Today is the fourth day and the topics and the faculties has been exemplary in this whole series. I would like to thank Dr. Gautam Khan, Dr. Partho, Dr. Biswajit for setting a new trend in this new era, new normal. Dr. Fugan, thank you very much for guiding all of us in any scientific initiative. Sanofi will always be with you for any scientific, scientific initiative. Thank you, sir, once again. Okay. 
thank you thank you over to dr sanjita thank you mr arun we are very fortunate today to have amongst us dr vidya sagar ramakrishnan sir as the guest faculty for today's session dr vidya sagar is the director of sagar ent and head and neck center vijayawada india he completed his post graduation from madras medical college with distinction and was awarded gold medal he completed his fellowship in snoring and sleep apnea surgeries from chicago usa under professor michael friedman and subsequently he accomplished fellowships in head and neck reconstructive surgery from indiana university and then in pediatric ent from wayne state university usa an ex associate professor in nri medical college dr vidya sagar has 17 published articles in peer reviewed journals and two textbook chapters the current president of indian association of surgeons for sleep apnea let me mention that dr vidya sagar has created an innovative tongue based resection procedure for management of obstructive sleep apnea welcome sir it is my pleasure to welcome our very own dr satyabrat kukon sir as the resource person for today's session for the benefit of the viewer let me give a brief introduction of dr sb kukon sir a senior ent and head and neck surgeon of guwahati with several years of experience to his credit dr sb pukon sir had completed his post graduation from assam medical college dibruga he had actively devoted 27 years of practice in mohenjo mohan hospital guwahati under the state government he has been the past president also the past honorary secretary in the northeastern branch of otolaryngologist of india he has been the past state nodal officer of national program for the prevention and control of deafness government of india with several presentations and publications at regional and national level dr sb pukan sir is currently practicing in guwahati and is enthusiastically involved in academic activities welcome sir thank you we also have amongst us dr ev ramam sir dr arpit sharma and dr tiruna bukarasu as panelists let me also introduce our in house faculties respected dr gautam khan sir dr bishri gogoi sir dr keshav ananda kaur sir and dr parthu protein bora sir as our speakers a quick word to the viewers before we start off the session kindly enter the questions in your chat box all the queries will be entertained at the end of all the presentations however we'll have special inputs from our guest faculties at the end of each talk let's now begin the session with dr gautam khan sir He'll be presenting on foreign body in aero digestive tract. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Sanchita. And uh, I have to set the ball rolling today with uh, my presentation on foreign bodies of the aero digestive tract. I hope you can see my slide. Yes, sir. Visible. Uh, yes. At the outset, let me thank my senior, my uh, mentor of sorts, and my. elder brother in a way and my biggest critic dr satyabrata fukan for being here because he he is one person i admire i respect and i am afraid of also because any mistake i make anywhere he will be first person to bluntly point it out to me so that i correct it and, and it has been going on for more than two decades now and uh, thank you for joining and dr vidya sagar uh, who is much younger than me probably and uh, but he has got such a huge reputation in whatever he does his uh, amount of pediatric work i mean pediatric airway work is also huge uh, thank you dr vidya sagar for joining and will be enlightened by your um, comments your insights dr thiru is another good friend a young person enthusiastic person will be hearing him in uh, on sunday again dr arpit has been there in all of the meets and of course dr raman sir for encouraging us not today not in this seminar it uh, webinar itself but from the time we formed our uh, pratiksha airway center so with these words i start off ladies and gentlemen uh, with foreign body of the aero digestive tract in fact i was telling on the first day our initial work on pediatric airway was mainly on foreign bodies later on we have actually uh, gone ahead with other things so children actually have a tendency to explore the world through their mouth they try to put anything and everything in their mouth and try to feel it and 
in that process, sometimes the things that they use for exploring can get stuck somewhere or the other. If it goes into the coins and things like that, usually end up in the digestive tract, or this is not this is a screw which has gone into the airway. So first, let us look into the ingested foreign bodies. The commonest ingested foreign body, according to literature, is the is a coin. Seventy percent of ingested foreign bodies has been the coin. Of course, in the recent times, various uh, studies have been done in different areas, and they have said the coin is gradually losing its place to the battery, to the cadmium cells battery, the small cells which have been increasingly used in various electronic gadgets. The symptoms could be drooling, dysphagia, pain, or dinophagia, or even the child may have a history of ingestion of a coin, but may not be having so much of dysphagia or drooling. He might be taking liquids easily because of the placement of the foreign body. Fish bone, chicken bone, etc., may get stuck in the hypertrophic tonsils or tongue base or the cricopharynx, and larger foreign bodies may get stuck to the cricopharynx or in the upper esophagus. Sometimes, if you look at the X-ray, you can see this air shadow. down in the esophagus here uh, this is because of a bolus of food getting stuck in the lower end of the esophagus these are situations if it happens in a child if it happens in adult also you have to investigate even in a child you have to investigate why the food bolus had got stuck there so regarding management for uh, ingested foreign bodies for confirmation if it happens to be a metallic foreign body most of the time the foreign body actual act of swallowing may not have been witnessed by somebody but if it if it has been witnessed also if they tell you that okay it's a, a coin or something like that the child was playing with you get a x ray done for a metallic foreign body it will definitely show up if it's a non metallic we have the choice of going for a endoscopy because that is the easiest thing for the digestive tract we can easily go in with a um, uh, exploder GI tract for examination or just for knowing whether the foreign body is there or not we can use a flexible the rigid is definitely necessary for removing foreign bodies from the aerodigestive tract we can have various foreign bodies if i put photographs the whole page will be taken up or even more but these are some of the riskier ones the one on the left right side of the screen is the is a cell which is very dangerous and this is uh, these are certain things which are picked up from the eighth edition of the scott brown the harm that batteries can cause the soft tissues form a electric circuit within the terminals of the battery button and hydrolyzing tissue from by forming hydroxide at the negative terminal then the leakage of alkaline from the battery when in a saline environment can cause problems there is pressure necrosis at a particular site and release of toxic compounds example mercury can cause systemic toxicity and uh, such a leaking battery actually would end up causing uh, ulceration in the esophagus and which could lead to perforations it could lead to medicinal infections there could be retropharyngeal abscess at worst or esophageal stenosis in the long run so this is what we have to say about ingested foreign bodies i have not put any videos because all of us must have must have a lot of experience on that let's go to the inhaled foreign bodies the more difficult part the issues the with the inhaled foreign bodies are whether it has been witnessed did somebody actually see the child see the foreign body been swallowed by the child that is the biggest problem sometimes the child has got a cough and he was playing with something of course at times uh, there is a definite history then we have to know about the type of the foreign body with uh, what type of it is is it a seed it is a uh, metallic object sometimes when the child has swallowed something like a bead or uh, you can have an example of it when they bring you another sample of the thing or a seed they tell you that this is the seed, particular seed that has been swallowed you have to look at the duration this is true for the swallowed foreign bodies also with the foreign bodies in the digestive tract and we have to assess the condition of the child this is something you are all aware we talked about it on day 1 the right bronchus is straighter and wider so most of the foreign body of the bronchus tends tends to end up in the right main bronchus and what could this foreign body do supposing it is a 
a vegetative foreign body like a gram seed. Initially, there will be only partial obstruction because the air can pass in and pass out and it will be uh, not causing that much of problem, maybe irritation, cough, etc. But as the foreign body swells up or if it is a bigger foreign body which is blocking the uh, airway and allowing only air to come into the go, go down but not go out, then you could have obstructive emphysema or if you have a situation where the airway is totally blocked, then you can have a obstructive chest electricity. So for again, for metallic foreign bodies, a chest x-ray or a CT actually will clinch the diagnosis. But for non-metallic is a problem. We could go for a virtual bronchoscopy or we could go for a flexible, uh, we can go for a flexible scopy to look for it. Most, many of the times it has been seen parents tend to, uh, not to agree to do a, a procedure under GA, which is also uh, not without risks when you're not sure about a foreign body because a cuff that has been going on lingering for a long time with uh, a mnemonic patch in the chest which has not been explained could actually ask for a warrant for a bronchoscopy. So the concerns are regarding anesthesia, regarding whether it, you will use a flexible scope or a rigid endoscope. Or open means actually what I meant is when you have a foreign body that's badly impacted, maybe a thoracotomy procedure might be needed. The decision making is affected by these points, whether it's a true aspiration or a suspicion. Did actually somebody see the child swallow the foreign body or he was playing with it, that's why the suspicion is there. Most of the time, the children actually end up in the second half of the day. The act might have happened in the afternoon, but they use most of the time, I would say 90% of the time, the child would be brought towards the end of your chambers, towards the evening, or even late at night. And here the question comes whether the, chi the child is stable or unstable. Then, as I said, whether you, can, you will do a rigid scopy, a flexible scopy, or a combined. We'll come to these points again. It also depends on your training, your experience, not only your experience, the experience of your team, as we said your team, your nurses, your technicians, your anesthetist, and of course your pediatrician friend. So this is something I picked up from one of Dr. Kishore Sandhu's deliberations. The anesthesia considerations, he had said, this is a very interesting uh, flow. Say if the child has come with adequate fasting, but is stable, suppose the child has come in the evening, or maybe say at 9, 8, 9 p.m. at night, you wouldn't like to go into the OR if the child is stable, we can wait and plan and do it in the morning. But if the same child who's been adequately fasting is unstable or having respiratory difficulty, then we have to take urgent action. If the child which, who has been brought in is in a, inadequately fasting, then if the child is stable at that point of time, then we can wait and plan. But if the child is unstable with respiratory difficulty, then immediately we have to have a plan B in place to immediately do something for the child. So rigid versus flexible, which, where, and when? Well, the rigid bronchoscope is definitely indicated when there is a witnessed foreign body, there's localization of the foreign body on a CT or a chest X-ray, there's mediastinal shift or it, uh, and there's signs of dyspnea. The flexible scope we can do when there's a, we have a doubtful history. We are not sure whether there's a foreign body or not, but there's a doubt and there's negative clinical examination, no X-ray findings, but there's a persistent cuff. The advantage of the rigid scopies is that we have better airway control, better ventilation. The forceps are robust, so you can grip the foreign bodies much better. And another advantage is the flexible scope can be passed through the rigid scope. The flexible scope has also got the advantage of correct localization of the foreign body especially in fragmented, suppose the peanut is broken when you are taken out. You can go in with a flexible scope and again look for that small broken piece where it has gone to in any of the smaller <laughs> bronchioles. Or when there's inflamed mucosa, when you go in with a rigid scope, there might be bleeding and you might have problems. If it is necessary to do it immediately, then you can do it with a flexible scope. This is a slide which I put up on day one also, but I am still putting it again. When we are going for a rem uh, foreign body removal, this is the sort of uh, layout of the OT that we have, but 
the nurse and the assistant surgeon should be in a position to hand over the correct instrument to the surgeon immediately so that you don't have you have to have at least two suctions ready and don't do not forget to put the tracheostomy trolley in the OT. You do not have to shout for the trolley when you need it. This is again a quote from Hollinger. I have been probably presenting it mostly in most of my presentations because I like it very much. If two hours are spent in preparations, the safe endoscopic procedure may take two minutes. But if only two minutes are taken for preparation, the endoscopist may find himself attempting makeshift ineffective procedure for the next two hours. I'll show you some examples of that also. Let's have some examples of foreign bodies removal. Well, uh, this is a foreign body which was in the right bronchus. It has been here. put the bronchoscope inside. Now you're touching the telescope here. And you can see there's a foreign body in the, just above the carina. So after we have seen, we will go in with the optical forcep and once we are there, and we take out the foreign body along with the school but this is not the end we go in again after taking out the school have uh, the second group if there is anything left behind <coughs> which is very important when you have a straightforward foreign body not causing too much of obstruction we do have the analysis down in the you, you, do, you tend to do things much comfortably, everything functions well. But there are times when things are not so easy or so good. So this is a situation of a, for a small child with a history of foreign body ingestion. And you can see there is the end of a pen actually, small point pen tip, which is there in the right main bronca. And as you can see, this is not the appropriate function to go in. And this is actually Cortina removal. But still then, the forcep could be held with the forceps and it could be brought out. But then it again got struck at the subject. It often happens. That is why we need to have the protection in case such a situation happens, there may be trouble that it can be. And in those situations, sometimes that you should have your this is one of the earlier cases where when we didn't have an optical concept and it was done by somebody else, I won't put any in of course, he is going in again with the wrong concept. For a peanut, it never possible to remove with a crocodile, but somehow gentleman concerned could manage to pull it out but it, has, it is a difficult issue so you need to have the proper instruments in place similar situation with uh, another forceps so that's why you need to have the appropriate forceps for the appropriate foreign bodies uh, this is another thing you may not maybe many of you might be having just <laughs> in the trachea so sorry and so when we went in actually <laughs> and uh, it, 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 out, it got stuck in the subglottis again so the facility was that dropping so we did a opening and we took it and we killed it with this note after it was trying to some amount of music, but no way out. Uh, this one comes out, and you can see the whistle there. So, difficult scenarios are when you have a fragmentation of the foreign body. The foreign body breaks, and you have small pieces, difficult to remove. The foreign body can migrate. Migration of foreign body, especially, it can happen in the esophagus. We have seen it happen in adults, but I have not seen, in, seen it happen in pediatric age group. We have had adults with uh, fish bones migrating into the neck and presenting as abscess. 
but not in pediatric age group. We can have impacted foreign bodies where, uh, where, where you have a, uh, where you might need a thoracotomy or an open procedure, and you have to have proper equipments in place. Airway edema is a, by repeated instrumentations using a large scope can cause airway edema of the mucosal lining. Hydrogenic trauma to the eyes or to the teeth is always a problem with all scopies. Bleeding is an issue and tracheostomy might be needed at times, as I said. From the anesthesia point of view, laryngospasm or bronchospasm is al always a fear. Pneumothorax can happen, even there may be cardiac arrest. For people who have been removing bronchial foreign bodies or doing a lot of airway work, the way the sound of the monitor, the beep beep goes down sometimes, the oxygen saturation, actually it's always a terrifying when you listen to it in the initial stages. And uh, the issues are the type of foreign body as we have already discussed, counseling regarding the risk. And of course, when you're doing it in a private setup, we have to also discuss about the financial issues because you never know the child might have to end up in a NICU or a PICU for a few days more. And uh, most of the parents or caregivers tend to think the foreign body has gone in so easily, it should be taken out similarly easily from the place where it got stuck. And consent is extremely important. So we have to be very delicate with these children and delicate with what we do. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. I do not have much experience with dormier basket. We do not have a dormier basket. We had used a urologic dormier basket once uh, uh, when in an adult, of course, but not in pediatrics. I think uh, I leave it open to the experts now. Dr. Vidya Sala, please come in. Hi, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, at the outset, I want to thank uh, everyone for on the panel for inviting me to be a part of this team. It's a fantastic uh, learning for me uh, all through this three plus this day, four days. Um, I'll try to add whatever I can, but um, with a short of time, I don't want to make it too much boring also because if you go into the topic of foreign body, the sky is the limit and we can show a lot and lot more cases. So if there is any, but, but at the outset, the comments wise, I think you have done a beautiful um, uh, talk, sir. You have uh, just told us what needs to be addressed, how the diagnosis has to be made, what is the role of the surgeon, what is the anesthesia's role and how important the post-operative uh, ICU is important, especially uh, in the foreign body as well as the preparations. I think the quote, I loved it the most. The quote was awesome, really nice. Sir. So uh, is there, I can show uh, just the picture of how the Darmia basket works. I can show how the innovative instruments, what we have designed uh, to take uh, various difficult foreign bodies. But uh, if I keep on showing all, then uh, I don't think there will be any time left for the others. So if you can tell me what exactly you want me to Sure, I can show them, sir. Um, sir. Can I yes, sir. Can I take permission from you? Please, sir. Uh, please, sir. Because we have arranged uh, the optical force. Yes, uh, sir. Because there's one emergency foreign body just coming to our endoscopy room. Yes, if sir. Can, if you can explain that thing, <laughs> Arpit don't laugh. Uh, seriously. Uh, let's see. We Which try to. Get the foreign body process ready. We'll, we'll demonstrate it. And in the meantime, uh, I request you to please you explain the way we are doing yes, wrong and how should you should go. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In yes, the meantime, Dr. Vidya Sagar can show us the Dormier basket slide. Uh, no, no, we are ready, yeah. sir. Saru, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can show, sir. Then. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sajid, sir. Yes. You can yes. show that. And uh, as I am just sharing, I got a phone call that yeah. I have got another patient, a child who has swallowed or aspirated a tamarind seed and they have called me to go and uh, remove it. So by chance, if the, if the child is being examined by the pediatrician, at any minute, if they call me, I may have to excuse and they, take your that's, that's more important. You. That's more important. Thank you, sir. I'm extremely sorry for that. But just now, as I was entering in, I got the call. So uh, I'll once I get the call only, I'll leave. Until then, I have time, sir. Vishwajit, we can see you. Can yes, you hear us? And for the audience, there is yeah. also in the YouTube channel of mine, yes. there is a special 
uh, YouTube uh, video for 15, less than 15 minutes to yeah. show how to use the instruments, optical yeah. forceps, what are the parts of the bronchi uh, bronchoscopes, what is a prism, how to use it. Everything has been described in detail and it is available in YouTube. So Dr. you can also see that. To you. Can you just, uh, for the benefit of the audience, just go, they will definitely log on to your website. Yes, uh, sir. Can you, can you just- No, I'll be there, sir. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. there. Yes. So the scope, what he's holding is a pediatric bronchoscope. So usually it is 36 millimeter long and usually it is a 2.7 uh, millimeter diameter. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah, yeah. so that is the uh, uh, rigid uh, bronchoscope that he is having in the hand. And it has a camera port like our nasal endoscope. And he is also having the bronchoscope that is connected. So now the next instrument, yeah, that is the bronchoscope. Bronchoscope in his left hand. And yes, the that is the bronchoscope. I think yellow is 3.5 usually, yes. if I am right. Yes. So it should be the 3.5. So the point I want you to know it is, is even though the size of the bronchoscope is 3.5, the inner diameter and the outer diameter is not 3.5. The inner diameter is 5 and the outer diameter is 5.7. So that you have to always keep in your mind. You should not think like an endotracheal tube, the outer diameter or the inner diameter is 3.5. So it is what it is. So please don't go by that. So always see, this is the most commonest bronchoscope that at least I use it in my practice. That is the 3.5 size and which has the inner diameter of five and the outer diameter of 5.7. So he has, sir, can you show the scope again? I'll show the parts. So this has, oh, this is size four. And the left-hand side is the light carrier port. Wherein he has put in a prism. You can take the prism and show the prism also for the audience. So he is just removing the prism. So see how it is. There will be two clicks. Yeah, you can take it out completely, sir. Yeah, so that is the prism. And the light passes through this light carrier and comes out through this black part. That is what is going to illuminate the entire bronchoscope. You can put it back, sir. That is the prism channel where it is going in. There will be two ticks or two clicks. So if it is going two clicks, then part of your vision will be obstructed. But the light illumination will be the maximum. But if you bring one click above, then you will be able to see completely as well as partial illumination will be there. The next port that you see exact opposite, that is north of it, is the ventilating port where his glove is. Yeah. So that is the, no, 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 the, the other port, sir. The, the index, index finger is holding. Your is, left, no, left. The left index finger that is holding. Uh, can, you, can you show that again? Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. So that is the ventilating port. So through which your anesthetist can also ventilate the bronchoscope while you are examining or while you are doing the procedure. But you have to always understand that when he is giving a blast of air, there could be a regurgitation of the air through the eyepiece. So for which we have a eyepiece that can be kept to close this eyepiece. Uh, there is a separate uh, port. Do you have it, sir, with you? If you don't have, that's okay. Like the sliding port. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that will all be shown in my video anyway. You can see it later. And the other port that is kind of projecting above is the port through which you can pass a, either a suction or you can pass even a laser cable. So if you have a small suction tubing, you can pass it through that and you can insert it all the way through this. Yes, so you can use that for either for suctioning or for using the laser. The seniors in the panel can obviously correct me if I'm making any mistakes. So that is in brief about the bronchoscope. And the next thing that you need to know is the optical forceps. Can you bring the optical forceps, sir? Sir, 
so this is the optical forceps so as sir is holding it you have to just hold it like your regular forceps like an autological forceps you can hold it but the most important thing that you need to understand is the endoscope or the telescope that you are inserting should be upside down or in other words it should be pointing upwards sir can you pass yeah this is the distal end of the peanut forceps the, there are multiple types of foreign body holding forceps this is the peanut forceps you also have a grasper you have a, a sharp toothed uh, forceps that can hold uh, 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 a tamarind seed or even a sitafel seed or a custard apple seed but this one has to be used especially for a soft for uh, soft uh, uh, foreign bodies like a peanut so you can see even the curvature how it is meant especially to hold the peanut so can you insert the telescope in it sir can you insert the telescope yeah this is how it opens and closes please yeah. don't use exorbitant force otherwise you can damage the forceps and these are pretty expensive uh, you have to be very careful and gentle while you are holding it but you have to be holding it firmly so that when you are pulling the foreign body it doesn't slip in the subglottis or the subglottic region is the place which is the narrowest portion yes sir you can show with the telescope in it uh, oh no he has I just breathe. inserted uh, uh, yes sir yes sir so this is just a um, bronchoscope and uh, he has connected the light carrier through this now he is passing a telescope this telescope has to go into the optical forceps you just leave it sir yeah exactly yeah the optical forceps that you just showed that is good sir okay yes you just insert it upside down sir upside down upside down upside down the, the optical forceps should yeah, exactly yes so that's how you have to take it in and the lock that he has shown it he has to once it goes in he will turn it right angle and that will make sure that the endoscope is locked in so can you pull it out it will not come out now then you attach your stores camera to this endoscope any camera i'm sorry i should not call for a particular company but majority of us use the stars so yes that's it so now it becomes a complete optical forceps and now this assembly has to go inside the bronchoscope which has been already inserted into the airway so he has shown it how it has been inserted the bronchoscope has to go insert when you insert it if your vocal cords are like this when you are inserting it you have to rotate it so that the apex of the bronchoscope does not injure the anterior commissure so that it has to go in like this and then you have to tilt it please please and focus then, please focus on the mo monitor please focus on the monitor yes so if this is the vocal cords my fingers are the if my fingers are the vocal cords if the bronchoscope goes directly like this this is going to injure the anti commissure right so it is always prudent to turn or tilt it 90 degrees and then insert the bronchoscope through the vocal cords and then once again tilt it and when you are when you are going and down you just tilt it downwards downwards don't go upwards if you go straight upwards you are going to hit the anterior part of the thyroid cartilage or the cricoid so you have to tilt it slightly 10 degrees downward and you will be in the airway so when you are taking it down you should look for the tracheal rings right. just to confirm that you are in the trachea and then you have to identify the carina and only then you are supposed to open your foreign body forceps only then you identify the foreign body go closer to it so that you don't push the foreign body inwards but at the same time you are not too far as well and then you try to grasp only the foreign body without pulling the forceps totally out you take the entire assembly of the bronchoscope as well as the optical forceps if 
the foreign body is bigger in one go with the firm grasp of the foreign body and that's how beautifully sar has removed it in one go now your job is not complete as you are removing it the anesthetist should be very ready to ventilate the child that is where we have two or three techniques one you can have another endotracheal tube through the nasopharynx and the anesthetist can oxygenate the child or he can mass ventilate meanwhile you put your rigid bronchoscope once again inside the airway and your assistant who also should be very much talented uh, should be quick with the reflexes and has to give you the endoscope to uh, check to do the check bronchoscopy and the purpose of check bronchoscopy is yes the purpose of check bronchoscopy is two things one as you are inserting it your anesthetist is going to put the ventilating port into the uh, ventilating uh, port of the bronchoscope and he will keep ventilating the child and at the same time you are going to insert the bronchoscope or the endoscope through the bronchoscope and see if there is any injury any residue or res uh, remnant of the foreign body and if there is any bleeding or not and if there is any secondary foreign body i can show you videos wherein i had patients wherein there were two different types of foreign body one in the right main another in the left main stem bronchi so it is always imperative to do a check bronchoscopy before you hand over the patient to your anesthetist at this point also you are strictly in control of the airway if there is hypoxia you have to take care of the airway you can just take the endotracheal tube intubate and keep ventilating so that the hypoxia doesn't set in below 60 and just give adequate time for that the saturation comes back to 100 at least give 10 puffs before you do your second examination and only if the saturation is maintaining well entitled co2 is normal and on auscultation air entry is adequate and there is no pneumothorax then you are going to hand over the child to the anesthetist and you are going to call off and follow up the child diligently in the post operative period as well uh, can i say one point here yes yes please uh, the preparation is uh, very much important before you uh, 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 important or uh, not the uh, pre also and the uh, most Sir, you're not audible. Because your voice is breaking. I think you were. Once you come for, uh, to the other room, you can talk here. Ah. Uh, your voice is breaking. Yes, sir. In the meantime, Doctor Pugan, sir, can I have a few comments from you? Actually, Vidya Sagar has given so nicely <laughs> because I am not much used to to this because optical forceps here only able with Doctor Gautam Khan, and I have seen the forceps, but I have actually in our days. i am a very much you know old procedure still rigid bronchoscope rigid esophagoscope in our days only we have done a foreign body in a medical college in my hospital of the government setup there is only rigid, rigid bronchoscope and rigid is there nothing fiber optic Hi, hello sir and therefore if more of a problem <laughs> is the when we foreign body come to child the child we have got a bronchoscope child but not for the you no know, esophagoscope for the child then we use the bronchoscope that is side hole we use the bronchoscope as a esophagoscope <laughs> to remove the foreign body and we do like that and moreover the coin is gotham has mentioned some com coins are in the cricopharyngeal opening just because anesthetist if i i tell the anesthetist you see don't remove the foreign body i will remove it this because he with yes. the mechanism he lift up no you will see the foreign body he with the mechanism for the pull it out exactly you put it And then I tell the patient, the anesthetist has removed it. He <laughs> becomes more confident. In yeah. our day, it is like that. I think. Well, just quickly, two points. One is the attachment is very important. So you have to do exercise before putting the scope and the sail. And second issue is they if I we should not bend too much. If you see, there is a. Uh, this is called a hello sign. If you bend in a little more on the lateral wall of the uh, trachea or anywhere, so gradually there is a micro toma of the scope and it gradually tears the scope. That's all. Thank you so much, sir. Very nice. Superb demonstration, sir. Superb demonstration. Oh, you demonstrate. You also spoke very nice about the different port and everything. Very nice. Very nice.
Raman sir, you wanted to say something? Yeah, if I can uh, quickly, Deepa, there, uh, we had uh, last night, you know, the student bodies are there even during COVID times. Yes. <laughs> so, last night when I was in the webinar, um, I was telling uh, Dr. Gautam Khan, there is a two-day baby in whom they were trying to um, intimate Peter mm -hmm. Robin syndrome. So and, uh, during the screen is off, sir. Uh, screen sharing, yeah. You can hear me? Yeah, with this. So this was a Pierre Robin child when they were intubating the child. I'll just take two minutes. I know I don't want to take away the limelight. Such a beautiful talk before and uh, wonderful comments by uh, the other doctors. Pierre Robin child, always it's difficult to intubate. During the intubation time, something has happened. And what has happened is that the bougie has gone into the esophagus. Um, so they tried to remove it. They couldn't. And this was the situation on the left side. So uh, what we did was uh, yesterday evening, I was in the webinar, Gautam Khan had uh, locked me in here. <laughs> so <laughs> Deepa rushed to the place and uh, in between I thought, two day baby, let us try something different. So I requested, and this is also to show off to you because our team is complete, so to say. We have a pediatric gastroenterologist with us. So I called him and I told him, can you try through the flexible scope? So he went in and tried, and I asked one of my colleagues to stand by in case there's any problem. He had apprehension whether the upper esophageal sphincter closure will create a problem because their instruments are long. They're not as powerful as us. So what happens is the end uh, place, that is whether it's a forcep or a loop or whatever it is, it doesn't function in the way that the rigid scope is doing. So he tried uh, doing an unfortunate flipped and uh, ultimately the it was in the stomach and uh, they could not pull it out. And they tried, attempted twice and it was just, uh, you know, fragmenting. Probably it was an old bougie. And uh, after that, it was, uh, we remembered or in retrospect, what uh, Dr. Gautam Khan pointed out, if the child is stable, wait, stay, um, uh, take precautions and do it. So this morning, early in the morning, uh, they went back again. And with this scope, 5.5 uh, gastroscope, they went and fished out the foreign body. And one of the reasons the whole thing was delayed to yesterday evening was because of the COVID testing. So COVID always is the back. You can see them wearing, wearing the appropriate suits and doing all those things. So foreign bodies are going to come. You have to be innovative. And if uh, something else is helping you like a gastroscope, so much for the patient. It's a two-day-old baby. So we did that. Now, I didn't tell you one very important thing. Um, every time they would pull the bougie, it would just break. So what they did was the child had a gastrostomy. So from the gastrostomy side, they pushed it up so that they could grasp it through the loop and it came out. Just thought I'll share it. When you think you've seen all the foreign bodies, some new foreign body comes. This is the first experience in my Thank, Thank you very you. much. So, and a piece you just showed. Deepa, the broken piece. No. Yeah. Uh, so, Dr. yeah, it's broken into three parts. You see, this is the complication that happens. If yes. you can see, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Daisy, you wanted to say something? Yes, excellent presentation. So, just I want to say that uh, the main in um, foreign body, the what we uh, feel is that the sharing of the same uh, and um, airway and anatomy is uh, what makes us difficult. Daisy, can I stop you for? For uh, information of everybody, Dr. Daisy is an anesthesia, uh, my colleague of ours, and uh, that's why I wanted to tell that before. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, uh, so the so the main uh, what we feel is that the main goals of anesthesia, which we always uh, be uh, aware in the foreign bodies, that we have to adequately oxygenate the patient, as uh, you have very nicely, sir, had said that control cardio or respiratory reflexes is very important during the bronchoscopy, but we feel, and the uh, rapid return of the upper airway reflexes is also very important. And the prevention of the pulmonary aspiration, as you have said that the neurorally, the solid and the liquid should be properly maintained, and uh, uh, preferably four hours for the solid, and for the liquid, it is one hour. Now it came down to one hour. And meticulous monitoring with the help of all the gases like uh, SpO2, the ETCO2, NIBP is also very important. And uh, in this foreign body, uh, in anesthesia, in our setup, as Sir has, we had done a lot of, uh, in prediction, we had done a lot of airway removal. And uh, pre oxygenation of a child, we feel, is very important. Uh, so, uh, amount of uh, pre, the glycopyrrolate or the atropine we used to give. 
uh, ketamine we used to give and intermittent relax as sir had said counselor says that the bronchospasm and laryngospasm is the most dangerous thing so we used to give succinyl choline in those cases where we find that we should have struggled the uh, baby and again uh, what uh, our faculty is also told, told that to keep the uh, one endotracheal tube in a nasopharynx that is also a very good approach we can uh, give the oxygenation into uh, while we are trying for the bronchoscopy that we can uh, give the oxygen to the nasopharynx area so these are the things uh, just we want to highlight it and uh, always the sevoflurane is there nowadays so that makes it very nice and after removal of the foreign body we always give uh, injectable uh, steroids or nebulization with adrenaline uh, thank you sir thank you sir thank you dr daisy um, vidya sagar you wanted sir, to show some yeah the dormia yeah, basket uh, yeah i think you asked for this one so i'll just show how it works uh, this works well especially for the beads so you have to pass this beyond the bead and then you have to open it and then you have to push it back so that's how we remove this uh, many times we may not have the actual video recording because uh, this happens so quickly and mm -hmm. it, it's like an emergency so right. we do this and then we think oh oh we should have recorded it that's how we recorded mm -hmm. this uh, wherein this was used so um, i wanted to also also show you how uh, dr raman sir has said so many times you have this uh, slipping foreign bodies right so uh, there are two things you can do for a slipping foreign bodies so one because of because of it being a vegetative foreign body it swells up and when when it swells up it be, it, it uh, our foreign body slips out from our foreign body forceps there are two things you can do one is you can actually break it into pieces and you can remove it so here i am showing you uh, one thing wherein we are breaking it into a piece and then we are removing it but the downside is you have to go in again and you have to remove the second part and then you have to do a check bronchoscopy that is number one number two is we have created this innovative instrument again we borrowed it from the gastro wherein we have designed a special instrument wherein it goes in and it pokes on the foreign body like this and it penetrates it and as you just withdraw it it comes out like our regular foreign body attached to it so that you can see how beautifully it comes out totally so this is one thing that we can do similarly we have designed for the coconut pieces which are like this we have designed with this kind of forceps and this for the custard apple seed these custard apple seeds they have a tendency to they have a tendency to slip off so you can i i'm also showing you this is the peanut foreign body forceps uh, optical forceps this is the grasper this is the another grasper various types of forceps that has been tried to remove this um, custard apple seed every time you see that is we are bringing the foreign body and as soon as we are nearing the subglottic region just below the vocal cords that is the narrowest portion and that slips out because the other end of the custard apple seed is kind of elongated so that end actually uh kind of gets stuck at the, the subglottic region and it slips off we tried using various uh instruments but finally we use this modified urology forceps wherein we are able to use it and it kind of grasps on the sideward action the thing that you need to notice is here when you press it it closes and when you releases it release the forceps it opens up so you need to know all this maneuvers before you try it on the patient actually so this is a wonderful uh, instrument that you can use it for the custard apple uh, seed removal uh like that when you have a long standing foreign body you that gets powdered off or smudged in what you can do is you can do like a ball you can just uh, insert a bronchoscope and you can just irrigate it and then you can have a trap and you can collect the uh, powdered smudge into this trap 
and that's how we did this for this patient. And obviously, you have to do a check bronchoscopy. Like this, I can go on and on for uh, an hour with so many innovations for hoops, for balloon dilators, uh, glittering rings, uh, uh, dentures and uh, glottis, uh, arica nets, blood in the bronchus. It's really challenging to take the blood clots. It is so, you cannot hold it with the foreign body forceps because it just gives up. And when you take it, it will be just a piece of part of the clot that will come. So like that, um, so many uh, uh, tricks and innovations have been done. Uh, but the one thing that I wanted to show is obviously the double surprise. This is the uh, foreign body that we thought uh, we are dealing just with a peanut. And as soon as we removed the peanut, we went ahead and we did a check bronchoscopy and we found that there was a arica net in the left mainstream bronchus and we had to uh, use the optical forceps to remove it. So like that, I can go on and on with the many types of foreign bodies. So um, shall I just show only one more, sir? Yes, please do. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just for the okay. want of time, I don't want to bore you with all. Yeah. Before you all, back. yes. So uh, as uh, Dr. Biswajit showed, it is always prudent to try yourself with the uh, uh, mannequins before you try it. You can try it on a goat larynx and then you can try it uh, on the patient actually. Uh, but the thing that I wanted to show is this one. So we thought that we had developed so many instrument armamentorium, but until we got this patient, I think uh, Dr. Raman sir has seen this. This is uh, a 19, uh, uh, this patient was, I think 12 or 13 year old a child who had been planned for lobectomy because uh, of uh, a long-standing uh, uh, lung complaint. And finally, they asked me to do a bronchoscopy. And as soon as I did it, I found that there was pus in the uh, right bronchus and I suctioned it uh, only to find that the right main stem bronchus was totally uh, narrowed or stenosed. So this is how it was stenosed. This uh, history is that it was a uh, foreign body that he has aspirated three years back and we tried to dilate it with the balloon. This is how a balloon works. Uh, so definitely the balloon did help us, but we were able to just see the distal foreign body that was beyond the stenotic segment. And at this point, we inserted our one of the modified foreign body forceps. That is nothing but the uh, uh, redesigned uh, forceps. And then we use the optical forceps. You're trying to uh, bring it out, but because of the stenotic segment, we were not able to do it. Now, this is the time we are using the Dormia basket. We passed through the whistle component. You can see the Dormia basket loop that has gone in through the foreign body so that we thought that we could bring it out. But guess what? We were not able to succeed. Then we did uh, use this sharp poking uh, foreign body forceps that we applied it. We tried to rotate it on and on, but we were not able to remove it. And finally, we were at the verge of, uh, I'm sorry. We were, uh, it was almost uh, one, one and a half hours gone. And uh, I called many seniors and asked what we can do it. And they all said that we have to go for an open procedure. But after consulting with one of the uh, senior, I went ahead the next day with this procedure wherein I used the diode laser and I made the striations into the bronchial stenosis. We asked the anesthetist to maintain the FiO2 in 21. And then we made this longitudinal striations using the laser. And once we dilated open the uh, bronchial stenotic segment, we were able to pass our traditional optical forceps and we were able to uh, remove this foreign body. We thought that we have removed it and we found that it was a result that was in total. But as a routine, we did a check bronchoscopy to find there was a, another foreign body that is the another piece of the whistle that was in the distal bronchiole 
and with the optical forceps we removed it and we did a check bronchoscopy and we were successfully uh, able to prevent uh, uh, lobectomy on this child so with this i want to thank uh, uh, the uh, seniors for giving me this opportunity uh, and the main take home message is we need to evolve and adapt with each difficult scenario and find a solution uh, to that if it presents again and we need to be innovative and impromptu we need to consult with your friends we should not let the ego to play in the management and we should discuss with our seniors and we should maintain a, a good armamentarium instrument armamentarium to deal with the difficult situations and always always it is imperative to do a check bronchoscopy and have a very good anesthetist to help you and a good interdepartmental help may also be uh, utilized and it is always a team effort and uh, thank you thank you thank Thanks. you dr vidya sagar i think uh, we will pass on to the next talk because we are a little behind schedule sorry sir no no not for you nothing we we, we learned so many things i have i have so heard much, you many times but so for other it's an eye opener because people come to know that how you can innovate and uh, people can get so many ideas i have heard your talk earlier also and i know your experience on foreign bodies that is why we put you on this day <laughs> thank you sir thank you thank you uh, anyway sanjita please take over yes yes sir. our next speaker is dr keshavananda kaur and he will be presenting on pediatric tracheotomy over to you sir thank you sanjita uh, good evening so today okay so since uh, the, the first day we are uh, talking about the pediatric uh, issues of uh, the, the pediatric airways in the first day we have uh, been saying that uh, uh, children are not mini adults or pediatric age uh, are not the mini adults so uh, that's why a pediatric tracheostomy is also a very different Uh, procedure in, altogether for a child in a, in a child than than in an adult case. Uh, so what what are the indications in a for a tracheostomy in a child? Uh, particularly, uh, there are we have currently we have only three particular indications like uh, laryngotracheal stenosis or a child is in a need of a prolonged ventilatory support due to some uh, like comorbidities or uh, and other issues. or if there is a need for a pulmonary toilet for permanent aspiration for the problem so what are the tubes which i have we we are we have to, uh, from if i uh, i remember from the beginning of uh, my practice there uh, there were not many options with us for the tracheostomy tubes in that in those times because particularly the metallic ones are available and the pvc ones were silicone they came a little later on and uh, we have a wide variety of now uh, uh, tubes available from various companies apart from silicone to cuff from clan cuff and soft cuff foam cuff and lot of varieties with uh, so what which tubes are the best So ideally, a tube should be soft enough not to exert pressure, any cause any injury or any discomfort, but at the same time to be rigid enough to avoid any collapse. The material uh, which is used uh, of the tube is uh, should be a, should have a very minimal tissue reaction. It should ideally have an inner cannula, but uh, that can be removed or cleaned. But in cases of pediatric, there there is small sizes they don't come with the inner cannulas. Uh, it should have a stellate or obturator for the uh, to facilitate the in insertion so the tube size guidelines the length it should not be too short because the, there are chances of accidental decannulation it should not be too long or it may uh, reach the carina it may abrade cause injury over the carina or into the right main stem bronchus longer tubes are desirable if there is a tracheal stenosis or tracheomalacia the length of the tube can be confirmed uh, immediately uh, uh, with the chest x ray in the icu post operatively or with a flexible endoscopy on the table itself the diameter it should not be too large 
to, uh, to cause any mucosal injury, which may in, in turn cause a secondary stenosis. And it should, uh, it, it will also cause the, uh, there, uh, um, it will not allow the air to leak. So that because of that, there will be inability to voice, which should not be too small. In case of a ventilate, ventilation is required, there will be excessive leak and inadequate air exchange. So it will be difficult to suction also. So tube sizes are based on inner diameters and uh, they roughly correspond to the endotracheal tube sizes. So this is a, a chart showing the age and accordingly the tube sizes are available with the various companies. Uh, uh, and they, as you see, they roughly correspond to the ET tube sizes here. And these are the suction uh, uh, suction uh, suction catheters which should be used accordingly with the appropriate sizes of the tracheostomy tubes. So before going for a tracheostomy, we should have a pre-evaluation with a, a fiber optic transnasal uh, flexible laryngoscopy, a trache laryngotracheoscopy, a rigid laryngotracheoscopy to rule out uh, the uh, any of what what kind of obstruction is there or what is the pathology with, for which we need the tracheostomy a esophagoscopy can also be done to rule out if there is any suspicion of uh, a tof or anything so the checklist is what is the indication we have to see i already mentioned the associated comorbidities we have to keep it uh, keep it on, on what are the airway issues that are present for which the tracheostomy is needed and the requirement of the ventilatory support and how long the tracheostomy tube is going to be there for this child. So based on this, uh, we have to decide what kind of tube, what kind of tracheostomy has to be done and how it has to be proceeded. So uh, we should not be, it's like uh, if I remember in earlier days of my uh, practice in the, immediately after the post-graduation, uh, used to do a lot of tracheostomy in adult, uh, adult, adult patients. So whenever there is a chance to get to do a uh, pediatric tracheostomy, so I used to get just jump up, uh, get, very, get very much excited that uh, this is something new which I have to go, which which I should try and we should go. But uh, when, but that is uh, that we should not be very much over enthusiastic in doing these uh, with uh, with the tracheostomy in, in a child. We have to be very meticulous to decide whether and how and when. So uh, the location of the tracheostomy is very criti critical in cases of pediatric uh, child, in a child. In suppose uh, the child needs a ventilator support or, a, or aspiration kind of thing, we are doing a tracheostomy that is formal airway, a third, fourth tracheal ring is ideal position. If there is in laryngotracheal stenosis, uh, then the uh, the, it should be very near to the stenosis. It's a very high up in the first tracheal ring or a very distal at, uh, at, at uh, say, say sixth or seventh tracheal ring. So that if there is a need for a further surgery, so then we have a trachea in between, a healthy trachea in between the resection area. If there is a tracheal stenosis, uh, not the laryngotracheal, the only the plain tracheal stenosis, then it should be through the stenosis. And this has to be uh, confirmed uh, from superiorly from a, either through a flexible or a rigid telescope. We can actually see the light at the stenotic point and we have to stab at that particular point only. So this is uh, like uh, we have to put a suspension laryngoscope first and we have put a rigid scope through uh, the larynx in the scope. And then on direct visualization on the light, we can do the tracheostomy at the exact site. So uh, in cases of intrathoracic tracheal stenosis, it should be a little lower down so that we can have a longer cannula stent so that we can bypass. Ideally, these stenoses are not uh, mostly related to, uh, uh, the pathology is not related to like the, the, those of the laryngotracheal stenosis. They, like yesterday, we have seen a case uh, by Bishop the, regarding the tracheal mass. If, uh, the situation is like that, which where there is an inability to do, uh, we are not able to intubate. In that case, in that case situations, we need a lower trache tracheostomy with a longer uh, tube size. If there is a recurrent stenosis, uh, at the former tracheostomy site only. So this 
show you the video. I can see the video. So this is how the triggers to me is done. A horizontal skin incision has been done and a continuous and uh, palpation. Uh, ideally, this is uh, the tracheostomy should always be performed under general, uh, if possible, to put a ET tube under general anesthesia only because uh, that airway, that uh, trachea is quite narrow down there. You may have difficulties during the to find the trachea at times. So, we Ideally, it is preferably to put under ETT. So once the subplatinal plane is made, you just incise in between the trap muscles here. So once the trachea is the, the free tracheal fascia has been just gently coagulated and incised. This is not the actual incision over the trachea right now. Just the, the pretracheal fascia has been separated. So before I'm incising the trachea here, we put a, a stay sutures. So these stay sutures are very much important. So these stay sutures are already put on both sides of the trachea. And between the, uh, through the stay switches, we incise the trachea, we open up. These stay switches help to retract the trachea. We, see that we have, uh, we, there are many, many ways of opening. Either you can use a vertical incision or you can use a horizontal incision between the cartilages and then split, uh, split it out. So here you can see we are using a silicone tube with a, this, the obturator, which helps to introduce it easily. So once it is in, these stay switches are cut short and then pasted down along the neck with the marking has to be done. So, so what are the variations? Uh, actually, uh, 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 yeah, on Sunday, I, uh, I, I, the Dr. Deepa has shown regarding the tracheostomy uh, maturation and all. So we actually have never tried uh, mature, maturing the tracheostoma. So ideally, it is done with uh, the tracheal wall is sutured over the, to the skin so that this helps in if, even if there is an accidental dis, uh, dislo 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 dislodgement of the tube. So there is a very easy way to put the tube inside. So the, this is sometimes where, where there is a critical situation when you need, uh, then you can have, do the maturation of the tracheostomy. Post-operative care, the child has to be transported directly to the ICU, uh, chest X-ray to confirm the tube position, to rule out pneumothorax. Sedation, uh, adequate sedation has to be there so that there is a minimal risk of accidental decannulation because uh, the, the tubes are not that much longer and they tend because the tube, the outer, outer part is quite bulky than the inner part. So there are very much chances of uh, the accidental decannulation and in the early periods of uh, early hours of the post-op surgery, if it gets decannulated, uh, it's a very catastrophic situation. So routine suctioning, humidification of air, uh, if the patient needs a ventilator support, then it can be on the ventilator or if it's an in PP, so we can have, you should put uh, HME devices so it's a, and do not change the tracheostomy ties. It has to be there as, as it is like. There uh, on a, we, we, their obturator and extra tracheostomy tubes at bedside should always be available of the same size or, or one size smaller. So 
after five to seven days of post-op, the tube has to be changed with a new one. And the primary ENT surgeon who have done the surgery, uh, tracheostomy, has to be the person to be changing the tube. It has, it should not be never be changed by any other person. Uh, in the neck as extended and fresh tube placed, stay sutures can be removed at this time. The ties can be changed and we can put a, and, and once you see the wound, if there is a sufficiently matured, maturation has been done over there, then it has to be confirmed so that in future, the parents or uh, apart from the surgeon, or any other can change the tube if needed and put on the HME devices. These are the HME devices which uh, provide the proper humidification and this comes with a uh, port uh, with, uh, to, to support the oxygen. Uh, Post-operatively, uh, later on stages, the hands-on caregiver training has to be given to the parents and to the, uh, the persons who, have, who will be taking care of the infant, of the child later on. Because uh, we, uh, we, we will, if there is going to be a little longer time, then uh, the tube has to be there for a longer time, then we need to train the caregiver properly. So since the tubes are single cannulas, so they require very much meticulous care. General trickers to make care, the wound care, the suctioning technique, everything has to be pinpointed and write it, uh, written down from point to point and how much suction has to be introduced and how much care and what has to be taken, what has to be done and what, what frequency of the intervals trickers to tubes has to be changed. CPR training is necessary if need, need arises and then we can plan for the discharge accordingly. So uh, this is uh, one uh, article in the International Pediatric Autoengal Group consensus that they, uh, the show of the routine perioper perioperative pediatric, uh, pediatric tracheostomy care is the same that I have mentioned. So what are the complications we see in the early, uh, early complications is mostly are the accidental decannulations. We can reduce this risk of accidental decannulation by adequate sedation and immobilization of the child, properly sized and, uh, uh, sized and secured tube, close monitoring and nursing care is very much important. Stage sutures are important. If there is a maturation of stoma has been done, but it has to be uh, looked down. Uh, there could be tube obstructions or mucus plug because of the mucus plug. So we can reduce the risk with uh, having humidified air, frequent suctioning, appropriate monitoring, and few cases, uh, pneumothorax, maybe their pneumodicin may be there, we can always look after that with the chest x and all hemorrhage, local infection, skin breakdown. So late complications, what we see is the tracheal granulomas because of the tube, either in the stomal area, uh, suprastomal or in the distal, in the lower down, there, there are chances that uh, the granuloma may develop because of the tube for a long, longer, if the tube is there for a longer period. So this risk can be reduced with proper medical care and proper sectioning technique and the appropriate sizing that is which is important. Uh, bronchoscopy can be done to rule uh, if there is, uh, if there is a development of granulation down below, then if needed, need arises, we can excise accordingly. A few obstruction, mucus plugging, of course, and accidental decannulation may happen in later stages as well, but uh, that's why if, if at home at all, this thing can happen. So the caregiver must have a very critical training regarding the management of immediately what can be done and how it can be done. Educate monitoring and home support, local infection. A uh, very important complication is if, which, uh, in a child which uh, needs a longer, uh, du a longer duration of tracheostomy, the speech delay may occur. So in that case, is if there is uh, a way we can, um, if there is, this is not, if this, that is not a case of a laryngotracheal stenosis or some, uh, or maybe some cause of neurological issue or some other comorbidities that tracheostomy has to be there. In that case, uh, this passive speaking valve comes, which can be placed, which is uh, just in tip of the uh, uh, tracheostomy tube. It is a one-way valve which takes the air in and lets the air out through the vocal cords. Uh, if the the tube has to be a little smaller size 
than what we use normally. And other late complications are suprastomal collapse may be there. There may be trachomalacia, uh, of suprastomal malacia happen, a tracheal or subglottic stenosis. Some, uh, there may be uh, tracheo-innominate fistula because uh, it has to be taken care of, uh, has to be looked upon if there is a sentinel bleed, or which can be seen in earlier discussions we have also uh, uh, discussed regarding that. That if there is an abnormal pulsation, you can see in the tracheostomy tube, then you should have a doubt that there's something wrong over the tube. And tracheoesophageal fistula uh, may happen if there is an associated nasogastric tube is in place. There may be uh, if your cuff tube is there also, and then there, then that can actually cause necrosis between the uh, tracheo and leading to a tracheoesophageal fistula. There are chances of tracheocutaneous fistula, which is uh, if there is uh, a post decannulation, sometimes uh, the wound may not heal. So in that case, there are chances. Of, so this risk increases with the duration of the trachea, uh, tracheostomy. And uh, there, if there is an, uh, if a staplasty tracheostomy has been done there, the tracheocutaneous fistula chances are in, much, much more than in the maturation stoma or in other way of doing the tracheostomy. It may require a surgical, proper surgical closure in the OT. Accidental decanulation may lead to uh, the most, uh, most, of, most, most of the time we may find even Deaths have been reported in the hospital itself because of decannulation and mucus plugging. So these, uh, this is this has to be very very much. Uh, we have to be careful because child they do, as a uh, they don't have that much of reserve. So once they are uh, the airway is lost, they may deteriorate like anything. So decannulation. So decannulation. We have to what what is the suitability criteria? Once once the patient is off the ventilator. The minimal suctioning is required. No obstructive pathology is there. Uh, we have to see uh, whether it is tolerating the capping or occlusion of, uh, while we are occlude the tube. If it tolerates that uh, without uh, without any problem, or we can downsize the tube one size and and just put a uh, put uh, occlude the tube and uh, do a check bronchoscopy. If everything is fine, we can go for a decannulation. And the procedure, it has to be done in the ICU for proper monitoring, downsizing can be done or direct removal can be done or direct, it depends at all, at all, at all depends the way the child is presenting. We also observe the child for next 24 to 72 hours, if everything is fine, then he, is, uh, he, is, he can be out of the trip. Thank you. Thank you, Keshav. Uh, Dr. Pukan, can you come in? For your comments, I think in your time, in your postgraduate days, you did not have the luxury of operating in under GA for all those diphtheria cases that we must have seen. Actually, when I have done the housemanship and postgraduate in 1976, 75 in Assam Medical College, Dibrugor, at that time, every day we have to do three tracheostomy pediatric in the other, because for the diphtheria cases. But polio cases, the vaccination was total failure at that time. Polio and also the your diphtheria. But diphtheria cases are more. Therefore, we have been taught the three white line. On the, when you open the neck, a vertical is a three white line. You always go pulpit, the lateral one, you avoid this two sides, right and left. And the pulpit, 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 then do the opening. Then don't we, we, we open the trachea suddenly. Your carbon dioxide goes the respiratory depression. You just hold your something, your finger like this, like this, like this. Then it will oxygen carbon dioxide will come up because there is nothing no there at the time no pediatrician no anesthetist also at the time only he will come on emergency but no anesthesia and then when he comes up then we'll just open the trachea nowadays in pediatric no cartilage may cut but with that we have that open and moreover it is important we have got to have to put the innative alternative metallic that is obsolete now in pediatric group and pediatric group with tracheostomy also not done very nice intratypical mm -hmm. but in that our in our days. We do like that, but ultimately many babies died. Actually, ultimately we thought that what this was actually not for the tracheostomy, but the cardiotoxin of the diphtheria toxin. More death was there. 
in this. It's really interesting that they care. They care, they care to me in that part. In our days, every day, three, four cases in the evening will be prepared with the tracheostomy tube and metallic tracheostomy, inertive, alternative, like that. But the data that some child has been recovered, but it is not about the death is mainly due to toxin because the ADS they have given put and the patient comes late. And this is very, very nicely explained in it. But other tracheostomy, I want to ask the Keshav, you have put that. Your subject was tracheotomy. Why put you write the tracheostomy, pediatric tracheostomy? Uh, tracheotomy and tracheostomy nowadays are uh, used uh, like uh, they can be synonymous. But uh, synonymous. Do, but in this uh, sense, Scott Brown, <laughs> tracheotomy is a sudden hole making a hole in a That's trachea. Right. But tracheostomy is a design, design with right. the tracheostomy that you have to stitch with the tracheal wall with the skin. And the fastening of the stays which are that is tracheostomy. But tracheotomy is that I think we should mean tracheotomy. Uh, doctor, doctor Raman can come in, Doctor. Uh, I think uh, Vidya has to attend to his patient. He suddenly left. Something like that, yes. I think uh, wonderful presentation, Doctor. I need to congratulate you. You covered all the aspects. Yes. And um, the other thing is that I won't waste much time. I think we have a long uh, series of talks. Uh, one observation is that, one uh, revelation is that we have an article of 100 pediatric tracheostomies in the period of 10 years published in the IGLO fairly recently. I'll give you the reference. It's not readily available at me. What we found was the indications for tracheostomy are being changing. Originally, it was, as Dr. Saab was saying, for the infections. Then it became because of ventilatory support and possibly obstruction, airway obstruction. Now what has happened is due to good advances in non-invasive ventilation, the need for doing, and the fact in neonates and in um, uh, pediatric age group, especially in neonates, you can keep the tube. There are reports where they've kept it for as long as three months without any problem. So you tend to postpone the tracheostomy, that is number one. Number two is that you give, uh, when you're weaning off the tube and uh, you can do non-invasive ventilation to nasal prongs or whatever. So right now, the number of uh, tracheostomies actually are going down. In fact, uh, last week we had uh, um, Dr. Um, um, uh, Dr. Kishore Sandhu, uh, who said that they haven't done a period neonatal tracheostomy for a very, very long time. So that's the situation. But now we are entering the third phase. The third phase is the immature lungs of the neonates, low birth weight babies. Yeah, uh, thank you, Deepa. She just put this for the youngsters, whoever wants to. It's a local study done in India. So I thought I'd share it with you, a 10 year study. So um, what now is happening is because of the immature lungs, they have bronchopulmonary dysplasias. And because of the stay in the NICU, they get infected. So initially it was infection. Then it was ventilatory support or obstruction. Then the obstruction has gone down because the pliability of the neonatal uh, trachea, fortunately, we don't get tracheal stenosis as often. Then finally, again, now we seem to be entering where the infection part is coming up. Hmm? So that was our observation. Rest of it, wonderful talk, excellent demonstration. One thing, Gautam, I asked yes. one, one comment from mm -hmm. Vidya Sakabar, he's busy about suprastomal ah. granulation and collapse. He made a flap on the upper part of the tracheostomy, tracheostome. I think he's busy with the phone, therefore. So the we'll, we'll ask him during the discussion. Oh, yes. I think he'll take the phone okay, and come back. Uh, okay. Our other experts, uh, they, yeah. we couldn't ask them questions. Before we go to the next up, very quickly from Dr. Arpit and Dr. Thiru, if, if you're around, just hmm. one or two comments. Please make it short. We have to go to the next up. So I think uh, since uh, Dr. Aman said, rightly said, the indications are going down. So whenever, whichever patient is requiring tracheostomy, especially in the neonate and the younger children group, we should go for a stoma maturation. It goes a long way and it really prevents decannulation. Whenever we are going for a tube change, always keep a uh, kind of a tube exchanger or a catheter or a bougie ready. It's always worthwhile to do that because many a times it happens that long-standing tracheostomy tube will have a lot of granulations around. You remove the tracheostomy tube, suddenly you won't be able to see the stoma and you are struggling with everything. So it really goes a long way if you're using the catheter to exchange the tube, even in the OT also. You should go with full preparation. Uh, uh, and the other thing is like whenever we are uh, uh, leaving the tracheocutaneous fistula, 
as of now uh, i feel it should be left for a secondary healing because whenever we are too much aggressive sometimes we end up kind of uh, creating more trouble for the child and the child may go in distress so i did maybe do a proper examination and then go for a, sec- a surgical closure otherwise you can just let it heal by secondary intention sometimes that is the a little bit of air that is required for the child so we should go slow in that yeah that's it thank you thank you Yeah. Uh, so, hello. So there's a raised hand from Daisy, ma'am. If she wants uh, to make a quick uh, point. Hello, sir. I'm sorry to interrupt, sir. Oh, yes, yes. We can understand. <laughs> I was in the call because of that emergency. No, I wanted uh, to about you about your suprastomal flap for the yes, female generation. Yes, sir. Exactly, sir. Thank you, Dr. Pukhan, sir. So that is a wonderful question. So what we found in our series is like we we gave a small cut a vertical cut over the tracheostoma and then we started inserting the uh, tracheostomy tube what it does is it prevents the suprastomal collapse what happens is when you make a, a tracheostoma and when you insert this tracheostomy tube this u shaped segment or genu is going to push the suprastomal tracheal component so what we do to avoid it is we make a small slit or half cut in the supra sup, uh, suprastomal tracheal ring so as soon as you make this this tracheostomy tube goes in and it is not causing that much of collapse so that is what we found it and i think we have even uh, published that video in the youtube also you may just try the pediatric tracheotomy and you will be able to see that if you want i can run that video also um but uh, if you are running short of time you can see it in the youtube so that is what we used to do so just make a small vertical slit or just half cut over the cartilage and that prevents it i will just quickly share only that portion so that uh, you will understand what i am saying uh, this this is the incision so one other thing we do is we do this lipectomy i think this is so important we need to remove the fat and we can see the anterior jugular vein i'm just going to fast forward it we by buzz it we divide in the midline and you can see the strap muscles we divide it separate it in the midline and then we go into the that is the thyroid veins and the isthmus of the thyroid we buzz it i'll just go and show the stoma first we yeah so this is how we make the appropriate size stoma so we take this tracheostomy tube and we print imprint over the uh, tracheal cartilage you can see the impression of the tracheostomy tube that it has given and then we make a window and that is the window in process we make a bark flap and then at this point i'll just pass it here yeah so can you see the small slit that i have given here so yes, this yes. slit what we make is for the tube when it gets inserted it kinds of splays open and it reduces the amount of suprastomal collapse that happens so that we can also put a bronchoscope and check that before making the slit and after making the slit and that's how we are reducing the incidence of the suprastomal collapse and possibly the granulation associated with it it does not negate it completely but it reduces it significantly that is our uh, limited experience that i wanted to share it and idea. i want thank you sir I thank you one from you and one from arpit about the tube change so that has been very good uh, when uh, we can apply it in our work as well <clears throat> sorry i missed a little bit of it sir yes, i sir. i think i have to go sir i am no, getting no, no, a call no. from the or so kindly free, excuse me i am extremely you sorry for an hour if you are free when you, you, you yes sir when you have and given this opportunity it's very not good of me to go in between but since the no, patient no, is being shifted thank you, thank you so much, much sir thank you. and thank if you in case you. i miss it i would like to see the recording of this uh, in yes. future so that i'll attend it sir thank you sir thank you so much sir bye thank you dear thank you
thank you all thank you sir thank you sir jai ram sir thank you everyone pukan sir thank you uh, counselor uh, before before the next presentation just quickly i want to say one po point yes sir sir uh, rp this is one of the very important thing if the child is required the ventilation the fixation of the tube so that it does not move and uh, tuposteli or in a four dimensional way so that uh, there is at least uh, tracheal damage that's one issue and and we can take help of a with a distressed child who uh, we can't intubate the child uh, if into if can intubate the tracheostomy is very easy but suppose in case of a grade four uh, grade three laryngeal where what then supraglottic airway with a good sedation and so that's uh, we can get at a proper position of the child that's um, that's another uh, take thank you sir okay so if thiru has no comments then we uh, i ask uh, sanchita uh, announced yeah i have many things to, to say but uh, we can move on because already you know there's so, so much yeah. been uh, spoken yeah. we'll, even the discussion said the end yeah yeah sunday we'll we'll discuss yeah uh, even today we can take it in the last now yeah. dr sanchita please yes, yes sir Uh, next speaker is Dr. Parto Pratim Bora sir, and he'll be talking on laryngeal hemangioma. Over to you, sir. No, uh, thank you, Sanjita. <clears throat> uh, good evening, everybody. I think my slides are visible. Yes, sir. Yes, yes it, it is visible. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, already, we had a very uh, a uh, good session on uh, tracheostomy and all i uh, carrying on with the session uh, my topic for today is subglottic hemangioma so uh, mostly uh, why i have put this picture is that uh, because uh, as we will be discussing more on the medical management of subglottic hemangioma and many a times when we start with pro propranolol uh, the drug of choice for subglottic hemangioma we think whether this drug will work or not Uh, this is a, a child who came to our OPD. We had got a, 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 a hemangioma right from birth. Uh, we started with propranolol from around two and a half months of age, and by six months, if you can see, uh, the uh, hemangioma has almost disappeared. Uh, this is how uh, magically the propranolol works, actually. So, uh, uh, carrying forward, I think uh, we have almost um, uh, gone through the funnel. Uh, we just discussed about laryngomalacia yesterday we discussed about the uh, the very rare laryngeal cleft also and today uh, we will be discussing about subglottic hemangioma which is again very rare around 1.5 to 3% cases uh, will present to our opd so around 60% of the infantile hemangiomas are mostly located in the head and neck region and out of which the subglottic hemangiomas are very rare there are benign tumors of the the airway and it accounts for only 1 to 5 1.5% of course this is one uh, congenital anomaly we were there is female preponderance uh, around 2 to 2 to 3 is to 1 so this is uh, uh, where most of the hemangiomas in children will be uh, will see uh, mostly in the beard region as it is said uh, mostly in the chin anterior neck in the lower lip and any child who has got a, uh, external hemangioma if he presents with a airway symptom especially with uh, Uh, we should think about a suggestive of a laryngeal pathology and in these cases mostly the subglottic <laughs> accounts for around 50% of cases so there is a natural uh, evolution of the uh, or involution of the uh, subglottic hemangioma basically uh, this is very important to understand the typical involution because uh, your therapy basically medical therapy will respond uh, depending on which phase of uh, involution you have started with the medication Uh, there is a rapid proliferative phase, usually occurs between four to six weeks of age. That's why most of the children will present around two years, around two months of age with symptoms, and then it and then there is again a four to ten months of life. There is a rapid proliferative phase, and it is during this proliferative phase uh, most of these drugs will act. And there is a symptom stabilization at around ten to twelve months of life, and then there is slow involution phase between ten to twelve months, and by five to ten years of age, usually it disappears. so understanding this three phase is essential about this uh, thinking about when we decide about the treatment options so according to bruckner uh, there is complete resolution occurs in 50% of cases by 5 years of age and 70% by the age of 7 years and 
almost by 10, 12 adolescents, 100% of these cases will disappear. So symptoms usually the infant is asymptomatic during the first weeks of life. They may present with an inspiratory spider, which, is, which could be basically biphasic. Uh, there could be burking cough. Uh, one important thing is that any pediatrician, uh, if he gets a recurrent or prolonged croup in a child, we should always think about a, a subglottic hemangioma. Because most of these children uh, will present to our OPDs uh, or kids and uh, small kids when they, when they present to our OPD. Uh, as a pediatrician, we often start using uh, steroids uh, whenever we get a child with croup. So if you give a uh, dose of steroid uh, and uh, after, uh, if you do a uh, scopy like later on, we might just miss the subglottic hemangiomas. So if a recurrent or a prolonged croup, uh, we should try to examine the child when the child is asymptomatic. And there could be voice alteration of varying degrees. The symptoms of respiratory distress could also be there with suprasternal and chest retractions. Some children may present with feeling difficulties and failure to thrive, depending on the severity of airway obstructions. And if the symptoms worsen at an early stage, then early intervention is indicated more strongly. Well, this is one child who presented to our OPD, uh, into our, in our emergency. The child had actually uh, severe respiratory distress. And uh, previously, uh, Dr. Raman sir was saying that, uh, especially with a laryngeal or a, a tracheal problem, most of the time the child will present with a, either with a uh, suprasternal or with a subcostal retraction mostly. You, you might see that there's no intercostal retraction. The child had severe uh, subcostal retractions. And uh, we did a, uh, since the child was in a very, uh, serious uh, condition, there was hypoxia, the child was not being able to maintain saturation. Uh, we thought there could be something obstructing the airway. So we had to do an emergency tracheostomy. This is actually was our first case of uh, subglottic hemangioma. So our experiences was not there. So initially when we uh, did a scopy later on, uh, we could see that there is a big hemangioma obstructing the uh, airway. We saw the uh, Cobulation, emergency cobulation, just to uh, open up the airway. So, uh, assessing a child who, who comes with uh, symptoms of a subglottic image, we might do an x ray neck where we can see some uh, subglottic narrowing. Sometimes in extensive or certain cases with therapy resistant, we might do a, a contrast enhanced MRI or CT NGO where we can see a narrowing of the subglottis. But the mainstay of diagnosis, of course, remains the rigid endoscopy under general anesthesia. But before going for rigid endoscopy, we should do a flexible endoscopy to rule out other pathologies of the airway, especially laryngomalacia and tracheomalacias. And out in this position, I'd just like to say one thing that especially whenever you are doing a flexible bronchoscopy, uh, if uh, while doing a bronchoscopy, you should be very gentle while doing it. If you do it in a jerky movement, uh, you might miss the subglottic hemangioma because uh, whenever you're putting the scope with a jerk, you might just uh, cross the hemangioma and you might miss it. So it has to be very, uh, uh, should be done smoothly. So uh, subglottic hemangioma, they appear as reddish smooth masses, mostly located in the left uh, posterior lateral subglottis and extended cranial to the undersurface of the vocal cords. We can have it in the right sided posterior and bilateral sub, uh, subglottic hemangiomas are also frequently seen. And these tumor masses are mostly spongy and compressible, allowing easy intubation with an tube uh, with no major risk of hemorrhage. So management mainly uh, is to maintain the uh, airway and, uh, uh, and we should try to avoid tracheostomy and long-term sequelae. So modalities of treatment includes uh, medical measurements endoscopic resections and open surgical resections. So mostly if you uh, get a child who's got a mild symptoms and, and who has crossed this proliferative phase, uh, we can have a watchful eye on him and we can just gently observe the child uh, so that there could be a spontaneous regression of the symptoms. Other therapies include steroid therapy, uh, interferon 2 alpha and uh, propranolol. Steroid therapy is mostly used as an adjunct therapy uh, for a short period of time. Only 25% of cases with subglottic hemangioma actually complete, uh, completely resolves when this treatment is administered alone. And steroid can be used in life-threatening emergencies, like you can give 30 milligrams of methylprednisolone for three days and then taper and then start on 
propanolol, uh, which will see the effect within three days of uh, within three days of starting treatment. For chronic use, propanolol is not indicated for a child with a cardiovascular disease or a child who has undergone a uh, cardiovascular surgery. In those cases, we might have to start with prednisolone, and we might have to give it around two to three milligram per kg per day for around four to six weeks, and then then uh, taper by around eight to ten weeks. Propanolol is of course the drug of choice in most of the time, and uh, we have to start with around one milligram per kg per day for three divided doses, and then we gently uh, increase around two milligram per kg per day over one week. Uh, whenever we uh, start an infant with on propanolol, we should always uh, monitor the pulse rate. We should have a uh, baseline pulse rate before starting the uh, drug, so that uh, if there's a decrease in around 20%, we know that the child has developed the side effect or there's a sense of heart block. Uh, we should look for hypoglycemia, and sometimes the children can also present with wheezing. Uh, generally, it is advised that while starting for panel, we should keep the child for at least for, for first three to five days in hospital. And uh, regarding the duration of treatment, the non segmental uh, 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 what is the non segmental usually respond by around three months, but for a uh, deep seated lesson, it may take up to one year also. So after uh, continuing with the treatment, uh, you have to taper propanolol, uh, depending on uh, the regression of symptoms. We can reduce by again one milligram per kg per day for one month, and then by 0.5 milligram, and we can uh, by next month one month, and then we can stop. And what we should always watch for rebound, and that could be an increase in 30 percent. Uh, interferon al uh, alpha 2a was initially started because uh, there was a, a study that. Interferon alpha uh, had a very good action on Kaposi's sarcoma, which is basically a vascular tumor. So uh, based on which uh, interferon to alpha was used at times, but now since there's a lot of uh, neurological complications that are associated with interferon to alpha 2A, so it has been abandoned at present. And one good thing about interferon is that it could be used in any stage of proliferation. And not only in the proliferative stage, you can even use interferon at the uh, involution phase also. So, and it has been said it is suboptimal efficacies. Other treatment modalities which are available are the endoscopic treatments. Uh, we can give interventional steroid injections. Uh, of course, it gives a very 75% uh, reduction in the uh, subglottic hemangioma size, but there's always a risk of uh, intubation and the child might need a uh, PICU uh, uh, admission. Laser resections are also available and we can use microdebrider submucosal resections. Open surgery, sometimes you might require tracheostomy and open excision of uh, subglottic hemangiomas through a learning go feature. Thank you. Thank you, Partho. That was very comprehensive. Uh, Dr. Fukan, can you come in? Partho, very good presentation. Actually, I do not know the hemangioma in the larynx. Actually, I asked Vishwa, why you put the bono cases are there? Then I have asked him, what is the treatment? Is it propanolol? Then I thought, I've gone to the eighth edition of Scott Brown and something. That I've seen. The, do you know the part of history of the, the, starting the molecule in hemangioma? Uh, Propanolol? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Actually, there is a nasal hemangioma once there. And the one uh, pediatrician, I think, yes, he has, uh, she has treated with consultation with cardiologist the propanolol on cardiac myopathy or something like that. And then ultimately the hemangioma reduced in the nose. Then therefore a proper nose acting on there. But you nicely described. Very good thing. Another yeah, interferon also. But anything. But one I think another molecule that's have I not used cyclophosphamide and and zincistine also used for hemangioma of this thing. Uh, there are studies where they have used vincristin and interlacinal vincristin also, but uh, since propanolol is a very good drug uh, that is in yeah, our is the best, is the gold standard. Uh, uh, people have stopped using uh, uh, those drugs actually. Yes, thank you. Dr. Raman, what is your opinion? I'm just going to repeat myself. I think on the first episode, I told you how we missed the diagnosis of the subglottic hemangioma because the child was admitted twice or thrice uh, with group uh, conditions. And every time we used to examine, the child already had a high dose of steroids and the hemangioma would disappear. And in between, it would come again. So please keep these two things in mind. One is a subglottic stenosis, uh, congenital grade one. And the other one is a subglottic hemangioma. They may present actually with recurrent croup. Recurrent croup below the age of one and a half or so is always very suspicious. 
Thank you. Can you comments, please? Yeah. Uh, hello. Yeah. Hello. I yeah, think my video in. is uh, blocked. Uh, uh, video. I'll put it on. You go. You go ahead. You go yeah. Ahead. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, like uh, you know, everyone uh, said uh, the propanolol is the treatment of uh, choice nowadays. So you know, the too much of uh, surgery either by uh, uh, open surgery or uh, um, close uh, uh, endoscopic surgery. Uh, everything is yeah. Everything is uh, uh, gone nowadays because uh, the, the propanolol works uh, very well uh, in uh, especially in the subglottic you know, subglottic uh, hemangioma. And uh, one important thing, like uh, Dr. Raman said, uh, you will have to differentiate it from the recurrent group because sometimes you will have a concentric uh, edema in the subglottis in the recurrent uh, group also, and uh, there uh, you know you should not mistake it as a uh, hemangioma. At the same time, when there is hemangioma, you should not mistake as a um, uh, recurrent uh, group. Nowadays, uh, interestingly, for recurrent group, uh, you know, uh, they have come up with uh, uh, some endoscopic management, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, recently I've uh, um, listened to one of the uh, uh, presentation by Dr. Rutter. What he says is, in recurrent group, when there is subglottic edema, concentric edema, you uh, cauterize that area like a point cauterization, like you know, uh, at uh, 12 o'clock position and then 3 o'clock position, 6 o'clock position, and uh, uh, 4 o'clock position, 7 o'clock, something like that. So, leave a little bit of a gap in between and do a concentric uh, cauterization in the subglottis when there is a recurrent group and edema. So, intervention is only for recurrent group and not for subglottic hemangioma. Nowadays, the hemangioma is, you know, vanished with the uh, propanol, and propanol is the treatment of choice. Uh, one point, but uh, uh, this is the world opinion, what Thiru is saying, I also believe strongly in it. But uh, Dr. Kishore's group, they say that you first use a CO2 laser, make it smaller, and then use propanol. I don't exactly agree with it, but I just want to say it in front of the audience, because they're saying that you reduce it and then use the propanol. We don't know. Keep the population out of necessity. I think we'll pass on to the next talk. If there are no more question, uh, queries, we'll take all the questions together in the end. Thank you, Pata. Sanchita, please. Yes, sir. Next, Dr. Vishwajit Gogoy, sir, will be presenting on airway radiology. Mm -hmm. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Sanchita. Good evening, my respected teachers and all dear colleagues. And most probably, this is my last talk of the web series. When we have designed the workshop, then I'm thinking why there should not be any radiology lecture. So that's then uh, we have a one more radiology session by Shivani. I will, it's a, it's a general overview. I'm not going details of the radiology and mostly on city. <laughs> But before going CT, we should not forget the X-rays, the classical X-ray, which we mostly in common OPD practice, we prefer for the you know, uh, enlarged adenoid, the X-ray nasal in case of the OSA or uh, the nasal obstruction. And uh, as today has a good, very good session on for anybody by counselor, and these are another most commonly prescribed uh, X-rays for foreign body. And though infection is nowadays less, but still we can get, and we can have to perform this kind of essay where you can find like, in case of a retropharyngeal abscess, we may get widening of ret retropharyngeal space. In case of acute epiglottis, we can may have a, a classical trumping sign. Also in case of a groove, we can get a stable sign. These are classical classroom must um, thing for us. And from the area perspective, why? want to say two x-rays here. One is x-ray lateral view of neck for a tracheostomized child and for the decanalation issue. If you, if you can appreciate <coughs> in this x-ray also, it doesn't require that they very heavily high resolution CT or MDCT. And you can appreciate what this uh, what is <coughs> what is it on his airway. And this is the position we can appreciate that he has a collapse uh, that's my super stomach collapse here. And another X-ray I always like to quote uh, refer. This is the X-ray. I have learned from this X-ray from Sanjay Sajdevasar from Delhi. 
that I have asked him. So how will you radiologically we know that we can decandidate or you can remove T2? So he said to me, so you do simply access of tissue neck lateral view and have a look uh, if there is any air, air flame um, between the soft tissue and the stent and or Montgomery tube. And if it is a free, they can, then you can easily remove. But if you can, if you can see here, there's a enough soft tissue which is hugging the Montgomery tube. So it's not ideal uh, to remove. But if you can appreciate there's a uh, endoscopically, we can see the uh, superior end, we can see the lower end, but it's very difficult to see the inter, that means middle portion where it hugs the uh, Montgomery tube. So there's a simple exercise you can say, we can remove the tube or not. So MDCT versus SRCT. For says I always thought that it was a SRCT and I not got that much of technical is between MDCT or SRCT. Basically MDCT is a raw image and SRCT it's a software or you can, nowadays um, these machines are mostly go with the uh, MDCT and they can format the SRCT things. And SRCT is specifically for interstitial or parenchyma and lung disease and MDCT for very good. As a whole, the whole raw image is given by the MDCT. And we can, with the help of the end software, we can go for three-dimensional, two-dimensional, all this thing. So basically, MDCT is for central airway. It's the primary imaging modality for the central airway. Current generation scanner provides very high spatial resolution image in a very quick time. That's the most important in case of a children because uh, they're mostly in a district, particularly in a distress side, it required, we, we generally get very less time. And most of these times required sedation, that's uh, the, uh, the experience of the center is very much um, essential. Uh, we need a very good pediatric anesthesiologist in the center. Also, it's very difficult for the intubated side, day side. I'm not telling you about the month side or uh, sometimes it's required. I'll go to share one, uh, uh, one case today. And that patients who was intubated already, and we have shifted from NICU to the center, uh, where required a radiological evaluation, where we need a very quick uh, uh, CT evaluation. And as I mentioned, it can reformat everything, 2D, 3D, everything. And uh, it's basically very advantageous for a AR, central area in perspective for an area stenosis, any kind of new uh, tumor or complex congenital area disorder. At, but it also ARA is a physiology, so we need a dynamic study. So in case of tracheomalacia, uh, this scan can also give a idea, a dynamic study. But it's very difficult in case of children. This is how the 2D images in a MDCT, the full ARA can appreciate <clears throat> from the glottic to the tracheal link, bronchus, and primary and secondary bronchus. And uh, this is how we can reformat that 3D. In a 3D is very interesting. I'll, I'll try to demonstrate if I can, uh, if I can, I don't know. Whatever you require, you require parenchyma, you will take the parenchyma. If you require the NGO, you take the NGO. If you require soft tissue, you can take the soft tissue. Uh, that way we can reconstruct the 3D images. Next, trachea. As you know, I take care is almost uh, c shape And it's, this is a long-standing uh, COPD cases where you get this scaffold trachea. And it basically, as I uh, said, that it's very good for the central area and mostly the pathogenesis of the subglottic stenosis. Here you can know the <clears throat> two-dimensional uh, uh, stenotic uh, stenosis. Also, how many log segment it is involving. So here you can appreciate uh, um, almost there's a three millimeter of uh, the segment is involved. And this is how we can appreciate tracheomalacia. It's a physiological and dynamic study. But again, I'm saying it's very difficult because it's very difficult to give the command to the side. And it's basically done in a full, it, this is a full ins inspiration that the whole lumen is widened. And if in a full expiration, if you can take, that's why the MDCT, they can very, very seconds, in a seconds, they can whole volume of data. That is the beauty of the MDCT. And if the full expression, if it cross more than 50% of the lumen, then it uh, it has a tracheomalacia. So similarly in a complex congenital anomaly, like uh, uh, right erotic arc, the secondary 
this is one of the causes of uh, secondary tachyomalacia or uh, shifting of the trachea and uh, left subclavian artery. This may also we can appreciate in CT. For body ground cuts, this is basically more important in case of radial sense with uh, plastic uh, foreign body and also the oral foreign body. And contrast is required sometimes if you have a mass in the mediastinum, and also sometimes we can go for the uh, go for any aberrant vessels like in a uh, erotic arc, which give a secondary tachyomalacia. But if you see this CT, don't believe this CT. It is a one-year-old child with a respiratory distress, not due to this mass. It's a basically thymus. So this thymus is not causing any kind of respiratory distress of this child. And uh, interestingly, we did the adenoidectomy of this side, and this side is gets well of his respiratory distress. Congenital neck mass, this is my uh, last case. Uh, so if you can appreciate, he's a, we have performed the CT on the fifth day of his life. We did the bronchoscopy, uh, but uh, afterward, uh, he has a distress uh, and he is not maintaining uh, situation. Then luckily our pediatrician has intubated the child, very in a very difficult situation. And uh, we have, uh, when you perform CT, we did the bronchoscopy, but bronchoscopy, there's a lots of uh, uh, difficulty. Uh, every time a bronchoscope gets stuck uh, and it's deviated towards the one side, and uh, we are not getting the idea of what happened with the, uh, with the cell. And we are trying to resist also. That's that time we have not the idea that five days old child has a death mass of glottic shift uh, because we have no that mass of experience. Then we have sent the child with a tube uh, for radiological evaluation. Then we have found this mass of neck mass. But antenatally, but it was a random case in our hospital. Actually, we have no pre of ultrasound and in the, of the patient. And uh, generally, this kind of mass we should diagnose antenatally. And we have found that this mass was uh, there, which is obscuring uh, the airway, pushing the trachea almost to the contrary trail side. And if you can appreciate the extension up to the nasopharynx, from the up to from the nasopharynx up to the suprasternal area. So this is the mass, and this is the rise to wind patient, and and we have excess the mass on the most probably ten days and the baby gets well. So we can extubate the child after 48 hours. So that's how sometimes uh, in a very early neonate uh, radiology, but it's very challenging uh, to put the uh, baby on the radiology center, the radiology cube. And that's why the antenatal history, antenatal radiology is very much important to know that uh, what the anatomy will, will uh, God will be going to give to the cell. This is how, if we can see the large snake uh, and the cystic lesions by our fetal medicine, but we have not, the parents are not convinced. Uh, somebody has tells he has a large tumor, so don't go for, and they have about the cell in a, under a hospital. So, but definitely we are waiting for to do exit and we are preparing for that, but we are not mm, uh, uh, give the delivery of the cell. So in conclusion, <coughs> CT is always a complementary to a bronchoscopy. It is a mostly important for the extraluminal pathology. Real-time CT can help in bronchoscopic biopsy. And very important to follow up for a pediatric radiation. So we should have to follow the guidelines provided. And so they should not be too much. And 3D reconstruction and virtual bronchoscopy, everything we can do from empty CT. So last, I want try to share one case in software. This is a DICOM software. So basically it's very important to see the brain of the cell also. So maybe there may be any neurological deficit. And if you go down, 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 then you can appreciate the PNS area. And then going down.
10 PFS. And glottic. So there's a uh, there's a little bit of one vocal cord is uh, medialized, paramedian position, and this is a trachea. And this is the trachea. This is at the level of thyroid, and uh, this is the tracheostomy. So in situ, and uh, we can. Going down hummus, lower trachea wall, there's an artifact somewhere. And this is how we can evaluate the whole uh, lumen. And then also, we can go with the, if you require the other cut also, this is how we can know that who is, if you, this is the, this is the midline. This is, you can see the midline of the airway. So we can have evaluate this. There's a, uh, stenotic segment here. I can you can also measure the how much it's formed from the tracheostomy side, and also how much part of the stenotic segment. So, also we can do. This is a three D ampere as. This is how we can, as what is required here, this software has a very, if you go here, then there's an NGO, airways, bone skin, bone skin to whatever, I am interested for airway. If you see the airway of this side, then we can appreciate his airway. Then you can a little bit turn. Then you can appreciate it. Then you can appreciate. This is the style. Most uh, yesterday, Kesave showed a video during his uh, tracheal stenosis. So you can appreciate. This is a tracheostomy. How beautifully this is. A, this this three D has a all the air. The sinuses are filled with air. Mastoid filled with air. This is the air column. This is the air column is coming, 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 and this is the stenotic segment. So this is how uh, we can take all these images and you can reconstruct wherever we require, whatever we have required. That's all from the city perspective. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Vishwajit. I think uh, we will finish off uh, the past paper and come to you or we'll uh, just uh, have the comments on your... I think we'll have the comments on the city, then we go to the ultrasound. Uh, Pukon, sir? Actually, your comments, I think that you comment has covered all from the triple science to at the 3D reconstruction. Only MRI he has not mentioned, no, not much needed actually, but he's not mentioned. But in, mentioned a MRI. Style, but in a distress style, for airway evaluation, MRI, lots of artifact. It's very difficult. And MRI required more time. So this MDCT sequence is hardly the required in case of sec two seconds. Good volume, two seconds, yes, sir. Thank Come you, on, sir. sir. Would you like to comment? Hello? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of uh, radiology in the airway. So in the first place. So I would like to do. I'm trying. Uh, I'm trying. Why not we have a radio radiology in the airway also? <laughs> yeah. So I would like to do even, you know, a repeat uh, bronchoscopy or uh, multiple scopies with uh, many uh, types of uh, scopies like rigid, ventilating bronchoscope, suspension laryngoscope, everything I do. Um, I generally don't do, um, you know, uh, CT or anything uh, that much. But except in few situations, one, when there is a complete ring, like uh, Dr. Raman uh, sir the other day said, the complete ring, uh, you know, to know the lower extent if you are not able to use the um, uh, scope and that too, you know, I'll try to use 
all the scopes you know i even uh, tried with uh, urology uh, scopes so in uh, some of the patients and uh, if you want to know the lower extent yes and another uh, situation is external compression if there is any external external compression then uh, the the ct would be very uh, useful and uh, maybe in some time when you are uh, having a very severe subglottic stenosis and the tracheostomy is done uh, outside already when you are not able to know the distance between the tracheostomy and the uh, subglottic uh, stenosis then uh, you know you cannot uh, prepare uh, uh, yourself for the type of surgery what you are going to do and maybe that time the reconstruction will uh, be of uh, help uh, more than that i don't think uh, the the radiology is going to be very much of help in, in uh, rb comments from dr raman please Uh, two quick points. One is keep in mind that there is tremendous amount of radiation exposure because it's based on the surface area of the child. The smaller the child, the more the radiation exposure. Second one is the child can get into trouble in the radiology suite. So be prepared. Something going wrong if the child doesn't have a tracheostomy, or even if the child has a tracheostomy, sudden embarrassment of the airway should not occur. So you should be able to resuscitate. These are the only two points. The uh, rest of it, Tiru has very elegantly put it across. That's why, sir, in case we intubated child, MRI can't do in a MRI. Uh, if we have a not proper facility for having intubated child, tracheostomized child, you cannot do MR in a tracheostomized child. Exactly. Also, exactly, sir. Exactly. Uh, and uh, repeat. quick comment before we uh, proceed ct with ct ngo is quite valuable in lower airway whenever there is a intra thoracic issues are there so because there are quite a bit of vascular anomalies compressing on the airway especially yeah. more so whenever you are having a complete ring there will be associated slings and uh, so all these things cannot be ruled out without any other investigation after tournament that's that's thank you a bit thank you yeah yes uh, Sanchita, you can come in for Dr. Deepika. On special request, uh, we have roped in Dr. Deepa Shivnani, who is a fellow in pediatric otolaryngology in the Children's Airway and Swallowing Center in Manipal Hospital, Bengaluru. She will be presenting on ultrasound in tracheal lesion, which is also her research topic under the able guidance of respected Dr. E. V. Raman sir. Over to you, Deepa. Dr. Deepa. Dr. Deepa is muted. Dr. Deepa, you have to unmute yourself. Dr. Deepa, kindly unmute yourself. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ranjit. I'm so sorry it was muted. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, yes. Okay. Please go thank ahead. You. Thank you so much, uh, the organization team, for giving me this opportunity. Okay, I was feeling a little nervous that before you start the talk, can you listen the comment that you are not a big fan. fan of radiation in airway okay i don't know how how come i have become a big fan of ultrasound in pediatric airway so let me discuss about this before we start i just want to say why why it is important why we are listening this talk and want to understand this so okay this is non invasive as compared to the bronchoscopy or a flexible scopy which is the gold standard for you know dynamic and anatomical structure and evaluation it is simple it is widely available everywhere it's a pain free procedure and it also gives real time dynamic images like our laryngoscopy so of course we should you know give a second thought to ultrasound for airway evaluation then before i start my presentation i would like to explain that this is a single institutional ongoing pilot study where still we are under evaluation in view of sensitivity and specificity that how you know how specific this test is as a screening test in comparison to our gold standard laryngoscopy and this is my personal opinion it's our hypothesis whether it will work or not so so you can just take it as a level 5 evidence and of course it needs further studies or you know multi center collaboration uh, to get the adequate data and calculation so okay before we go for the pathology again let's learn what is the normal airway on ultrasound images 
so here i'll show you okay i won't go in the proper anatomy anatomy because we all know how the axial cut and sagittal cut of airway looks in a normal soft tissue and bony structures but on ultrasound just look at this image the v shape inverted v shape uh, this structure is our cartilage which is thyroid cartilage and uh, okay this will look little hypoechoic or hyperechoic sometimes and here it comes our vocal cords and at the end of the vocal cord this again hyperechoic lesion will be your retinoid just keep this in mind when i run the video then you will understand better this view has been taken with the transverse uh, uh, probe in a transverse view where we get this axial cut next comes the sagittal cut okay in sagittal cut they say the trachea looks like string of bead appearance the black black tiny tiny beads if you can appreciate on the screen these are the tracheal rings and if we go towards upper the cephalic end this big uh, um, bead is the cricoid then it comes the crico uh, uh, thyrocricoid membrane and this is the uh, thyroid cartilage so you initially this ultrasound of airway was used uh, just to check the et position whether it is in the trachea or it's in esophagus or to do the crico thyrotomy at this level and and here comes uh, wherever there is the uh, Uh, soft tissue and air interface this hyperechoic line you can make out and then comes these artifacts which we call as reverberant effect and this is our trachea so to make you more understand just see this this is the thyroid cartilage this is the cricoid and these are the tiny tiny our tracheal rings and this is the portion of trachea now if i zoom this image further this is our cricoid cartilage and here comes the trachea and for your understanding again cricoid will come with some, sometimes with the mirror image thyroid cricothyroid membrane area and this is the tracheal part so this is the normal anatomy with which you uh, look in our mind uh, keep in our mind then how to perform this uh, investigation so i'll just uh, run a short video here okay so child should be calm and relaxed otherwise we will get false positive uh, results Uh, if we compare this for the tracheal malacia or laryngeal malacia so child will be relaxed the head should be little extended neck should be extended if required you can keep one shoulder bag under the shoulders and we use the linear probe and keep in a transverse way for the transverse view and the sagittal or vertical view on the trachea on the sternum for the uh, sagittal view so then comes the cases i won't go in the clinical case and clinical presentation much because it is more of the radiology so straight forward i'll tell you what case it is so here is a case of laryngo malacia why i want to show this just to show that this child is having isolated suprastomal retraction when child is still and awake there is no xiphoid retractions or very minimal subcostal retraction so here comes my hypothesis what i was feeling okay if child is having only suprasternal retraction there could be two possibilities either this is a isolated case of laryngeal malacia isolated laryngeal malacia without involving the tracheal malacia or child is having mild grade of laryngeal malacia this is the same child when child is sleeping neck extended and again i cannot see any xiphoid retraction so again i assume okay there is no tracheal malacia component is just the laryngeal malacia then comes our um, ultrasound images okay before i run this video just revise how it looks like it's a axial view again the transverse view here this hyperechoic uh, inverted v shape is a thyroid cartilage okay this is not that prominent because this view is little higher up where we can see the epiglottis this uh, this crescentic hyperechoic uh, point is the epiglottis attachment and this hyperechoic uh, linear arrays are our retinoid now i'll just run this video and see this is a case of laryngeal malacia now we are getting see the video. see the dynamic uh, uh, view whenever child is breathing you can see the tick tock tick tock prolapse of this epiglottis in the airway so this is our epiglottis with every inspiration it is coming in a way and when we are still on a stable cut on the neck so this is the 
uh, laryngomalacia. It's a dynamic study on ultrasound. And here we did the endoscopy for the same child. And here is the view that this child was having laryngomalacia. Definitely it's an initial phase so we have to compare our result with the gold standard result. But as I told you, it's still ongoing. So we don't know what is the sensitivity, but I'm pretty sure the sensitivity uh, might go high. Uh, we don't know, but yes. So this is one case. Now come to the case two. Again, this child was a term baby and uh, we got the reference that child was having tachypnea. He was not maintaining saturation saturation without oxygen and uh, when we saw the child was having this zephoid retraction just focus on this part suprasternal there is no retraction child is not having any strider also so we were like okay and then again my hypothesis this looks like more or something lower airway pathology not in the upper airway probably somewhere here probably somewhere in the trachea or bronchus probably some malicia component which is uh, causing this retractions. Then we went through and we did the ultrasound. So we started from the top. So this is the view of the axial view of the vocal cord level and the epiglottis. And you look at the epiglottis. No, no tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. It's just stable. I'll just run through the previous video just for the comparison that how the um, uh, laryngomalacia was, uh, you know, visible on the ultrasound. See with the every respiration, inspiration, it's coming in a way like the collapsibility. Then here you see in this child, it is just stable. Child is breathing, the slight movement of the vocal cords you can appreciate, but epiglottis is absolutely stable. Then we went down. Oh, before I explain the sagittal view, I'll just tell you this is the thoracic part of the trachea and this is the lowermost part of the trachea uh, near the carina. Then when we went inside, what we found that, okay, the upper part of the trachea is not collapsing, but yes, there is minimal collapse on the lower part. Then we did the endoscopy and here is the endoscopic view and confirmation. The upper rings are fairly okay. There is not much collapse of the lumen of the trachea, but as you go further down, you can appreciate that there is the malicious segment on specifically on the lower tracheal rings. So this was the case of tracheomalacia, isolated tracheomalacia. Ultimately, we sent this child home with the BiPEP support because uh, child was not maintaining saturation without oxygen. And we did the CT also, and there was no extra luminal compression because of the uh, double aortic arch or any vessel compression. So we told that, okay, child should be, should grow a little bit, and then we'll see whether this malicia component will go or not, and child recovered gradually. Then this was the dynamic study. Now I'm putting it together with the anatomical lesions. Okay, why it is important and what is the most common anatomical lesion we are getting in airway, especially pediatric airway. So number one and most common is the recurrent respiratory papillomatosis, where you are dealing with a child, you are debulking the tumor, the papillomas, and again, after two weeks or three weeks time, you're calling them back or you're calling them back if they feel the hoarseness. Okay, now you have done the surgery, post of day 7th to 10th, child has come back to you by saying child has developed hoarseness and child was having acute attack of upper respiratory tract infection. Now here we are confused. Oh, should we take this child for endoscopy because it's just at seven days old and this child was doing so well. But what now the papilloma has turned up into aggressive way or what it is? This child will end up into laryngoscopy, one more uh, anesthesia exposure. Then again, this hypothesis come in a picture that what if we evaluate this with the ultrasound and we can prevent whether this hoarseness, hoarseness is because of the upper respiratory tract infection or it is typically because of the uh, papilloma lesion. So here comes the one more case. Again, it's the same axial view. And okay, I'll tell you the papilloma lesions will, uh, will be seen on the ultrasound with the hyperechoic lesion. So before I run the video, I'll just tell you to compare this video with this still picture. This is the left vocal cord where the hyperechoic lesion were mostly on the anterior part involving the anterior commissure, involving the right vocal cord and major bulk on the right vocal cord and the middle part, as you can see here. So this is the ultrasound. 
of the child. So before surgery, we took this child. Okay, all these cases came with the hoarseness and uh, we have no other option than taking these kids for the laryngoscopy if these kids are a known case of laryngeal papilloma. Then we found, okay, there is an adequate airway, but yes, there is a huge bulk on the right side. So we went into uh, for endoscopy and we found this was the image. Again, the positive result as compared to ultrasound. This was the first case. Then the next case, okay, here again, when we did this child, this child again on the post-op day, eighth mom came, the child has developed again hoarseness of voice. Initially, immediately after the surgery, it was very good. And uh, she got some cough and cold two days back. And we got confused. So in seven days, it is pretty, pretty fast. It has turned up, otherwise child was stable. Then we did the ultrasound and we found there were tiny, tiny, uh, you know, hyper quite lesion on the left side okay some lesion the big lesion as compared to other lesions on the anterior commissure and tiny tiny lesions on the right vocal cord but the airway was pretty adequate on the ultrasound when we took this child for the endoscopy you can see it's not the post-surgery uh, if you have seen the papillomas it's a pre-surgery image and they were tiny tiny and we thought oh we should have waited more we could have given some medication for the cough and cold and for hoarseness we should have evaluated later but we never know how this papilloma turned up sometimes very fast sometimes very slow then uh, we'll discuss one more case here again same they came after two weeks child was stable but they came with the complaint of hoarseness and when we did the ultrasound oh my god we couldn't even see the airway inside they were all hyperechoic lesion on the both the side major bulk this bulk you can see on the right side is pretty prominent as compared to the left and when we did the endoscopy for this child this was the image which we found huge papilloma this was just 14 days and we were thinking oh god we should have called this patient on the seventh day or tenth post-op day how come in two weeks time it turned up so well child could have landed up into severe strider in the tracheostomy then then again this hypothesis came then when to perform laryngoscopy Preferably, if we go for this ultrasound and if we find good sensitivity and specificity, we may uh, take our calls for this papilloma lesion, specifically these kind of cases, that if we find such presentation on the ultrasound, we can tell the child, okay, we can wait and watch. And we can tell this child for frequent follow-ups in every 48 hours or 30, uh, you know, 72 hours. But if we are seeing the cases like this, then definitely this, this uh, child needs immediate um, theater admission and uh, DL scopy uh, procedure. So here we comes with the uh, hypothesis that when to perform laryngoscopy, the ultrasound can give us a clue. Okay, so this, uh, this case was uh, like anatomical lesion. There is one more anatomical interesting lesion I want to show you that we, we can pick up on the ultrasound. Yes, this is the one. So this is a case of subclotic stenosis. And here you see, these are the arytenoids. So we are at the vocal cord level still, you can make out. Okay, uh, before I go further down, I'll just tell you, when we are seeing the vocal cord level, you will see the inverted V-shaped cartilage image. But if you go further down, the cricoid, it will be little U-shape or the dome shape, little circular, it will be thicker than the uh, thyroid cartilage. So just have a look gradually. If you want, I can play this again. This is at the arytenoid. You know, now we are going down. See this, we are at the cricoid level. You can make out that the shape has changed. And this, see this beauty. This is the subglottic stenosis. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but we have to wind up because we are already late. Be yes, a little fast. Yes. Don't mind. This is the last. So this is the subglottic stenosis here in the endoscopy image. And this is the ultrasound subglottic stenosis presentation. Okay, so I'll just conclude that yes, the characteristic ultrasonographic appearance is available for airway diagnosis, whether it is dynamic or it is anatomical. And definitely it is useful diagnostic tool for operating planning for papilloma children. And evaluation of the child with hoarseness is significantly less traumatic than in laryngoscopy. But I would like to take a opinion of other experts here in this webinar that uh, what is your experience and what is the next step we can go with this ultrasound? Thank you. There I end my presentation. Thank you. So sorry for interrupting you in between no because problem. I watch. It's a very interesting study, a lot of food for thought. Uh, my only concern would be that uh, ultrasound, not only here but anywhere, is very operator dependent because it's the person, it's a very person variable, not like a CT scan. 
but of course you have the advantage of no radiation a quick uh, way to go about it i uh, i'd like to uh, since uh, i cannot ask dr raman sir because that was his uh, idea and <laughs> the, uh, may, may i ask dr phukan uh, sir uh, dr yeah, rp yeah. no i only mean, two two lines actually very nice presentation but it's a real innovation actually you are doing that uh, ultrasound personally you know Oh uh, no, sir! Actually, I have taken the help of radiologist, but I yeah, strongly yeah. feel ENT knows better than the radiologist as far as this airway is concerned. I surprisingly, I went to library and saw this diagnostic ultrasound book, and in the index there was no trachea mentioned there. So I was like, okay, what it is this? I could not find the trachea and ultrasound airway. So yeah. I was telling them, okay, they just go a little up. Uh, epiglottis will come a little high up. I want to see the epiglottis view, the cartilage view. So I think we can start this. Yes, yeah, because yes, yeah. because obstetrician okay. and surgeons do their own uh, ultrasound nowadays because they, they yes. can detect very nicely. Yes. So, when I talk, the literature says I had cited a Japanese paper where they say that ultrasound is more useful than MRI because in MRI because of the swelling they get a lot of artifacts. Artifacts. Yes. Uh, now the concept of what is called as point of contact ultrasound has come. So what is happening is the neonatologists are training themselves in ultrasound, so that they don't have the ch children. In fact, uh, um, Deepa does work very closely with the neonatologists and then with yeah, the radiologists yeah. to cross check with this, each discipline. And since uh, it's a new thing, she's just learning, and yeah, hopefully yeah. it will be of some use. And, and also, um, and, yeah, uh, and also mm -hmm. the anesthesiologist they use uh, ultrasound to you know pick up uh, the cricoid uh, level. Exactly. And all those things. So maybe we can uh, also rope in them their their ideas uh, about the airway and uh, stuff. And it is a very fascinating, uh, you know, uh, idea. Uh, first, uh, first of all, I have to congratulate you because uh, in case you know we are, we are also waiting to uh, get the results from you. In case if if it is going to be the same like uh, the uh, scopies, or at least you know uh, uh, ninety percent of the uh, uh, sensitivity of the scopy, then we can might as well do uh, like uh, Dr. Gautam said. This is going to be only the you know non-invasive. And also non-radiation induced. Only problem is, like he said, it's operator dependent. So if you are sitting with the radiologist and you are giving your input and they are taking, you know, our mm -hmm. input, it it's going to be the mutual way. You can you know find uh, the way uh, the common uh, uh, platform so that we can come up with a good uh, um, or protocol uh, how to uh, do it. Then maybe it will it will be very useful in future. And uh, we are we are waiting for your results. Sure. Thank so you. Sir, I think that the learning curve is very short. I think we can pick it up quickly. And with the sensitivity. Yeah, system, yeah. yeah it's like you know any other part. any other you know. Uh, uh, Obstetrician, obstetricians, and, and all. So they'll just yeah. go for uh, some six weeks training, and they'll start doing ultrasound. Yes. So it's not going to be a very big thing for us. So and routinely we are using uh, uh, during difficult airway just before the anesthetist intubates. It's called escape laryngoscopy, where they know exactly how to intubate. So that's the concept on which the following things uh, Deepa has been uh, developing. It's her original uh, thought. So a young person should be encouraged. It's a brilliant idea. Take it forward. Maybe if you think yeah, about in our theater, in our theater, there is ultrasound machine. Yes, sir. In we our theater, the there is ultrasound the machine we can kept by a anesthesiologist, so that they can they can you know always I use it. Pass on to Sanchita for the question answers. Sanchita, please go ahead. Yes, sir. So from the first of the questions are as uh, Dr. Om Prakash Sharma sir has asked, can fragmented foreign body which is difficult to pick up, be left alone in the airway tract so that it comes out on cuffing. Could you repeat that again? Sure, what sir. Fragmented foreign body, which is difficult to pick up, be left alone in the airway tract so that it comes out on cuffing. Uh, it may, if you, if you do not have the equipment, suppose you have taken out a peanut and a very small piece is there which has gone down into a terminal bronchiole and you can't access it. Yes, it might come out. That's uh, that's quite a valid point. The only time we have actually left behind a bigger foreign body was in an adult. He was a laryngectomy patient who was always wearing his uh, silver ejection tube. It was a long time back. And the obturator broke. 
it went in one of the terminal things and we tried all our best we didn't use laryngectomy was done in cmc so they went to cmc there also they tried and ultimately they said you live with it and that guy he lived for a long time with the foreign body in his lung uh, no open surgeries anyway please next next question is from dr madhu mangal singh how do the panelists manage a toy gun plastic round pellet stuck yeah. in one of the bronchus it went in one of the terminal things and we tried all our best we didn't use laryngectomy was done in cmc so they went to see there also they tried and ultimately they said you live with it and that guy he lived for a long time with the foreign body in his lab no open surgery is some what ah he is a overlap of overlap of sound i guess did you get the question sir yeah yeah madhu mangal singh was how come that Sound is coming from somewhere from the our web. No, no, no. The ask the question, Madhu Mangal's question. Ah, uh, the toy gun. What did you say? Yeah. Uh, how do the panelists manage a toy gun plastic round pellet which is stuck in one of the bronchus? I think it's the same way. You have to you have to have your uh, assortment of forceps. You cannot be having a bronchoscope and only one forcep. That is what I tried to. elaborate in the various videos because if you do not have an assortment of things you will be in a mess when you try to take it out because you don't know which forcep is going to give you a better grip anything from arpit uh, oh yeah yes, theory coming yeah, yeah. so see um, you know in that situation instead of using a dormia basket there is a, a specifically useful uh, basket for bronchoscopy only by stores so you can um, buy that stores basket so that will be useful for this kind of um, metal round foreign bodies so dalmia uh, basket it is very difficult to you know go and catch it but uh, this uh, stores uh, uh, basket will be very useful because it has got uh, something like rings so that it, it goes there opens up and once it is going inside then you can easily pull it out so that uh, force will be very useful yeah arpit also wants to add something yeah yeah three things can be tried over here if you don't have a basket then what you can use a wide bore suction and you put the suction in with through the rigid bronchoscopy sheath and don't turn it on when you are at the foreign body turn it on it may sometime get uh, sucked into the suction if it are it's not getting into the suction but still still hold it and you can just withdraw it another thing is you can use adrenaline plaget so a uh, surrounding edema which may be there is like preventing the uh, adequate forceps space or the forceps forceps to engage on the foreign body so that may be helpful third thing that you can use is the angioplasty balloons also if you don't have a dormia basket what you can use a 2 3 mm angioplasty balloon just kind of maneuver it beyond the foreign body and try to inflate it and then try to pull it out these yeah. things may work yeah there are two issues actually one is the toy gun which have the plastic uh, balls those are if, if you have a rat tooth force you can hold it with that but the ball bearing type of things are the most difficult because yeah, it tend to slip out and we can we can use the maneuvers that both of you have talked about again it depends on your experience your expertise and your range of uh, and your ability to innovate actually at that point of time raman sir would you like to add there and uh, or we pass on to the next okay anchita come Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Pradeep Kumar Tiwari and Dr. S. N. Mukherjee, sir, has praised your presentation. Yeah. Moving ahead, uh, Dr. Jaman, sir, has congratulated Dr. Bishwa, sir, for his demonstration, and sends his regard to Dr. Vidya Sagar, sir, for his guidance there. And he also commented that he had similar experience as Pukan, sir, had mentioned uh, about foreign body in the cryo pairings and anesthesiologists taking it out. <laughs> then uh, there's a comment from dr kudu shamet sir he is saying uh, when i was a senior resident at sardarjam hospital in the late uh, 1970s early 1980s we were fortunate to get a new set of storage rigid bronchoscopes with prism and optical forceps and foreign body removal became very much easier than the scopes with no fiber optic lighting prior to that we did not have any camera those days and we had to look through the scope through the open end and do our work with the naked eye as it were yes then dr p v l and murthy sir's comment to dr vidya sagar sir saying that it is an excellent idea for impacted foreign body bronchus removal 
in regards to his last uh, presentation. Then uh, Dr. Pradeep Kumar Tiwari pays his regard to Vidyasandar sir for his informative talk. And then uh, should I go ahead with the next questions from the second talk? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Please. Okay. Uh, from this pediatric tracheotomy, uh, Dr. P. V. L. N. Murthy sir is asking uh, for pediatric tracheotomy, which type of tracheal incision is better, horizontal intercartilaginous or tracheal cartilage destruct destructing vertical incision? Keshav sir, the question is to you. Okay. Uh, I uh, usually we we use the vertical incision. Uh, I also, as uh, Dr. Vidyasagar told, that he uh, particularly uses my, might be the horizontal incision and that gives a slit to the, uh, and the upper suprastomal uh, ring so that there is, a, uh, there is no suprastomal collapse. But with the vertical slit, we can avoid that suprastomal collapse when we have already slit, the, uh, we have the incision along the vert vertical. So it's basically user dependent and uh, the the need for the tracheostomy. Hiru, uh, you want to with some yeah. points on Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, basically, uh, we used to do a lot of vertical incision earlier. So then, uh, you know, after uh, my uh, uh, short session uh, in uh, Switzerland, when I saw how uh, Professor Monier and uh, Kishore Sandhu does, then uh, came back and I started doing a lower flap, lower yolk uh, flap. So that is uh, uh, intercartilaginous horizontal incision on both sides. Just wondering and bring the lower uh, uh, ring to the lower skin so that you will have something like a lower flap will be acting like a base for the tracheostomy tube to sit on. So number one. Number two, you will do maturation switches all around. So when you do maturation switches all around, you also do, you, you'll be doing the maturation switcher in the upper part also. That will bring the uh, uh, superior part of the um, uh, tracheal ring to the skin so that the suprastomal collapse problem won't be there, number two. Number three is when you have complete uh, maturation switches, then the granulation tissue formation will be less. Number four, whenever there is uh, accidental extubation, you can easily put it back again because there is no chance of uh, a false passage because already you have created a, a good, a nice uh, uh, track. And uh, most of the problems, especially in a very small babies in neonatal uh, units, the first week uh, is the biggest problem. In case if it comes out, that is, there is a more chance of coming out because the tube will be very short and it will be you know, uh, very highly placed and it, it can easily come out. In that case, they will be panicked to put this back again. And always they will ask us for the uh, tube exchange in the first uh, um, uh, tube change. So that will be somewhere around seven to 10 days. After I started doing this technique, uh, we started uh, changing the tube within five days, number one. Number two, the ICU and the uh, NICU fellows will start uh, changing the tubes. They will never expect the uh, ENT surgeon to come for uh, because already there is a complete track uh, there and uh, there is no chance of putting it anywhere else and there is no chance of granulation to you so the first week will be very good but now after coming in this uh, covid uh, period now i started again the vertical incision for uh, the few few uh, uh, cases because you can't you want to keep the airway open for a long time while you're doing the maturation sutures. So what now the, the recommendation is keep the endotracheal tube little lower down, inflate the cuff, keep it, you know, uh, 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 inflated and keep the child completely knocked off. So there should not be any respiration in between. So while completely paralyzed, you make a, a space suture both sides, just a vertical cut into the tube again. So now, again, I have done a vertical suture for two, three uh, uh, patients. We are also doing a, a comparative uh, study of uh, this uh, vertical suture and uh, the maturation suture with lower uh, flap like uh, Lausanne technique. Almost like uh, more than 100 uh, cases we have collected. So probably we'll be publishing it also soon. No, no, more than two rings is important, uh, if possible. Uh, secondly, the the size of the tube, oversized tracheostomy tube, exactly. the stomach should match with it. 
sir basically we should go our size tube for this during this covid period nice not only take us take us to the endotracheal tube also In, any other comments otherwise we pass on to the next question go to go to next question yeah anjita okay. Uh, there is a comment from Dr. Kudu Shamir sir in regards to Keshav sir's presentation uh, to keep a tracheal dilator when changing a tracheotomy tube apart from a spare tube. Then uh, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi ma'am and Dr. Pradeep Kumar Tiwari has again complimented uh, the presentations. Dr. Pradeep Kumar Tiwari is also commenting that uh, he usually keeps the maturation tide for seven to ten days. It really helps. Then uh, there's a question from Dr. Pradeep uh, to S. B. Pukon sir: Is it a must to take prophylactic antibiotics after diphtheria cases, tracheostomy? What? After uh, tracheostomy in diphtheria cases, is it a must to take prophylactic antibiotics? Diphtheria cases. Yes. If you done some tracheostomy. But diphtheria cases, the anti the antibiotic was at that time is the benzyl penicillin. Benzyl penicillin is the D drug in diphtheria cases. Still, I think I. But there is now no. Still, the diphtheria comes from Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, some districts from Assam also. But the D drug is the benzyl penicillin antibiotic. We give the benzyl at the time. I think in in addition to what Dr. Kudu Samit sir had pointed out about the tracheal dilator, I think what Arpit said is a very good idea of railroading sort of thing. Putting the catheter inside that that is a sure shot because if the, even if the child moves a little bit. Your stoma and the tracheal opening tends not to be in alignment, so having a tube there would would be a big help. Next, please. Uh, the questions from the third talk. This is uh, a comment from Dr. P. V. L. N. Murthy, sir. He commented that it is a nice hemangioma case, but it is better to use M. L. W. Van rather than Evac seventy for excision. Then, uh, Dr. Reshmi M. Nayar, ma'am. Uh, Is asking, will there be a difficulty in differentiating subglottic edema from hemangioma? Any characteristic endoscopic findings to differentiate the same? Mishojit, Patho, Mishojit, yeah, Patho, Patho, please. I think uh, subglottic edema are mostly associated with infections, and in this, basically, we find we find in children with laryngotracheal bronchitis. And whereas uh, in subglottic hemangioma, we we'll have a particular area, mostly the posterior aspect of the glottis, where we might find a red uh, uh, spongy lesion. But in sub uh, in edema, it will be a concentric edema surrounding the whole of the larynx, and not a particular part basically. So that is the one differentiating point when we do an endoscopy. And moreover, in sub in edema, we are not going to do a scopy as such, um, because most of these edemas are going to uh, resolve on its own when the infection process goes down. Hemangioma mm -hmm. will be um, compressible. Yeah, compressible. Basically. Compressible. Yeah. And there could be telltale signs of other which is elsewhere in the body as well. Yeah. And if the, if it is only only edema, you can use a uh, um, uh, adrenaline um, patty. Just keep it there for some time. So then, if it is only edema, that will go off. So that is uh, just for for a few uh, minutes or so. It will be there. So we can also do that as a differentiating point. Thank you, Sanchita. Next, please. Next question. Yes, sir. So last round of questions from Airway Radiology. Uh, Doctor S N Mukherjee, sir, is asking Bishwajit, sir, about the histopathological diagnosis of the mask which was excised, shown in his presentation. That next is Sanchita. Any idea? Sanchita, any idea? What is the what will be the histopathology report? What was the histopathology report? I'm asking you. Okay. <laughs> she was not there. She was not yes. there. She was not there. It was a congenital thyroglossal cyst. Okay. Anim, congenital thyroglossal cyst. It was not in the midline also. That was very interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. Uh, there's a comment from Dr. P. V. L. N. Murthy, sir, uh, regarding radiology. He's saying I totally agree with Dr. Thiru. Thiru, uh, Thiru. Even for radiology, child requires sedation or intubation. If M. L. B. shows any abnormal lumen or abnormal pulsations in the lumen, then C. T. will help. 
again he has commented that uh, he has uh, regarding the the presentation by dr deepa uh, he said that he has tried eight patients similar with first ultrasound followed by mlb along with anesthesiologist but uh, didn't find much information about the laryngeal mucosa and the rest of the structures can you comment if you have any comments or dr raman can come in yeah i mean laryngeal mucosa obviously you can't see basically you have to see the air uh, soft tissue shadow to find out the how much of the airway is patent basically one but the more important thing which uh, was a revelation to us also the dynamic nature of the lesions was very well uh, seen um, so that is the advice. it's a complementary test it's a trial going on very well used as thiru was also saying anesthetists are using to see the airway for intubation so why don't we have a look at that and then they can plan their intubation in those difficult cases as to know where exactly the space is even if they are using a video laryngoscope they mentally prepared how to introduce the tube and in the some time back i told you when uh, the buji in that uh, pierre robinson case um, uh, where uh, the buji went and uh, into the um, uh, esophagus so if they were forewarned maybe maybe you don't know they can they can plan it's an additional information Yeah, please. <clears throat> A last question from the chat box. Uh, this is from Dr. Vidya Dharan, doc, uh, to Dr. Deep actually. Uh, he's asking, what is the ultrasound probe you use in the cases? Is it different probe than the routine one? No, no, it's the same one. We use a linear probe. Uh, both are available 7.5 megahertz and 13 megahertz, and we found with 13 megahertz picture. Um, were uh, pretty clear than 7.5. So it's the same what radiologists are using, whatever is available in our theater and in our emergency setup. It's the same common probe. There is an ultrasound machine actually now in the neonatology unit. So it makes it very accessible to us. So I said this, this is called the point of contact ultrasound. That's what the neonatologists do. They don't want to send the children here, there, everywhere. It has to be done on the bedside because these children are very fragile. So we're just taking advantage of something that is already there. So Sanchita, have you come to the end of the question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No more questions, sir. Do you have any comments or parting comments from any of yeah. the experts yes, or any of the... Yeah, apart from you want to say. Yeah, I want to say. Just a comment for uh, Dr. Deepa's work, basically. Maybe next year when we have the uh, pediatric airway workshop again, you might get an ultrasonic classification of the airway disorders, maybe a new classification of laryngomyelitis and all. Uh, that is uh, the really good work that she's doing, I think, uh, that we really... And secondly, uh, I think only thing is that when we are dependent on the radiologists, uh, only thing that they should not write in their report is that this could uh, clinically. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Deepa. Thank yeah, you. Are we, no, 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 something. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we have discussed so many, so much about the optical forceps, but I think there's a good place for a regular bronchoscopy forceps also, because I feel the optical forceps, the diameter is slightly bigger. So many a times you may find it little slightly bigger for the foreign body, especially in a child less than one year old. And yes. uh, so, and again, the kind of image we are getting because it's just the end on view. Uh, the, because just next to the scope endpoint of the scope, so you are just uh, uh, the vision is obstructed by the prongs of the optical forceps. So you may not be able to see the uh, good uh, view of the foreign body also sometimes. So it's good to have another kind of a regular uh, foreign body forceps that can be used with a rigid bronchoscope. Another thing yeah. is, yeah, uh, another thing is whenever you are doing a chiku seed or a reka nut or a tamarind seed, it's always good thought to have a tracheostomy standby ready. You never know okay, whether you'll be able to kind of uh, deliver the foreign body or not. And especially the areca nut and all is sometimes very, very tricky foreign body. So always have a good assistant and a tracheostomy standby ready, whichever foreign body you're doing. Yeah, and that, is why, I think that is why I had actually shown in the slide about the OT setup. You have to have, because I have had cases which got stuck in the subglottis and the anesthetist couldn't even push it down with the endotracheal tube. And uh, regarding the forceps, see, till I did not have an optical forcep till around six years back. Yeah. So previously, almost say 15 years or so, we have been doing by looking through the scope and using our uh, rap tooth forceps. 
I still have a lot of faith on the Raptor Force, especially for things where you have to insinuate your uh, flange between the foreign body and the tracheal wall. The optical forceps actually become a bit larger, as you pointed out. They are yeah. a bit, bit bulkier. Especially for the pen cap when you're removing, you need a yeah, one-sided yeah. opening forceps that can easily kind of negotiate that whatever space is there. It's I still sure remember that. one Rekha nut that uh, we had to do. I had to do a tracheostomy and I had to use an endoscope and a mosquito forceps to kind of uh, deliver it because we were not able to hold it in any kind of a forceps because it was so much of an edema around and yeah, after doing everything, still we were not able to hold it. We have to eventually deliver with a mosquito through the tracheostomy opening and like uh, finish it out. Well, no, well, using uh, this uh, the basic difference between the optical forceps and the regular forceps is optical forceps you have to uh, have your vision right. So you you are seeing and everyone is seeing you are removing it. But with this forceps, only the tactile feeling. Tactile, uh, Dr. Fukan uh, will agree. My boss used to tell me when you are removing the uh, uh, peanuts, you will have to have a half grip. It's not like a complete grip, and uh, at the same time, you should not uh, let it go also. So that's called half grip, he says. So you'll have to feel it, and that with that tactile sensation, without giving too much of pressure, you'll have to remove it. So that, you know, the, 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 the older old timers have done, you know, beautifully, but, uh, you know, it is very difficult for us because we started everything by watching, like, you know, breast surgeries, microscopic surgeries, and uh, foreign body removal, everything. But they have the good uh, tactile uh, sensation, and the hand-eye coordination also would be, should be very good to do that. You know, yeah. your, your generation is a spoiled generation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's foreign yeah. the, the technology. One of the foreign body <laughs> removal <laughs> without an ICU or a backup and all that. Vishwaji <laughs> always tells me, you did the thing blindly. You did the thing blindly. How did your babies not die? <laughs> actually, in pediatric group also, one thing should be mentioned that the child has got a ten tendency to put the forehead, something in the mouth. And next is the attention deficit and hyperactive disorder. The child usually kick with the foreign bodies. And they put their second time, third time. I have found third time also. The foreign body, they put same thing. Difficult to counsel the parents also. And one thing as uh, Peter told that I have done one less, young girl, about long back, about 15, 20 back, that your ear top stuck in the trachea, below subglottis. Then you like your tracheostomy and the muscular artery for I removed it. <laughs> like this. It, like it is, it is like Dr. Uh, uh, Raman said, we are also uh, spoiled and also the young generation, the case is also spoiled now. So yes, off yes, late, we are getting, you know, this lockdown and all, we are getting more number of button batteries. So I know I wanted to uh, you know, spread the message to the uh, parents nowadays because uh, children are living uh, uh, at home throughout the day and also they are using a lot of gadgets like, you know, TV and the uh, uh, remote uh, toys and everything. And the possibility of uh, button batteries are, you know, being kept outside very high nowadays. And one more thing is the button batteries now what we are getting is the lithium batteries. These lithium batteries, even if it is worn out, if it is put outside, if it goes into the uh, um, uh, esophagus, when it uh, it gets you know communicated by the mucosa, the whole circuit starts again within 15 uh, minutes. It starts discharging the uh, current. So that's what the uh, uh, people are uh, telling. And one more thing, uh, by the, uh, um, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, they have done a study and they have uh, given a recommendations to start giving honey. Before, you know, as early as possible, you have to remove it. In between the time, though, you have to educate the parents to give honey. The honey will goes, uh, goes uh, and, and this will have a coat around the button battery so that the discharge won't be there because there is no contact with the mucosa and there is no uh, complete uh, circuit. And also, this will neutralize if something is leaking out like alkaline leak. This will uh, neutralize it. So that is what uh, is uh, important now. We are also having that kind of patients, more number of patients because of the spoiled uh, uh, generation. Thank <laughs> so you. Thank you, everyone. I think we will end here for today. And uh, next, we are meeting on Sunday morning. Viswajit at 8.30.
Lastly, one question I want to I, I want to give a hello. I want to give a compliment. Godam, I want to give a I want to give a compliment. Hello. Yes, yes, we can we can hear you. We can hear you. All you have here, do you that is organized by one group, GBSB. Anyone knows the GBSB group? <laughs> it, is, it, is related, it is related to the airport people, the GBR group. Not the airport people. <laughs> you are not discussing it. But I thank yeah. the people, all people. The GBSB group is a Gautam, Vivek, and Surajit and Bisha. Oh, and, okay. <laughs> and they are not only doing this uh, webinar, but they are basically doing many academic activities. Not only yeah. that, they are involved in many social things like disabled people, deafness, they've got particularly, they many things have got there, social activities. With this thank, you, sir. thank you, sir, for pointing it out and heads off to their team approach and got yes, yes, yes. Yeah, Thank you. They are doing all the innovative works and like this. Thank you. Uh, them, thank thank you. you. you again. Them, one thing I have asked you, pediatric airway, the exposure is very problem because you have to got a good training, good infrastructure, good armor material that we have not got because you have to good center, particularly teamwork. Otherwise, you cannot do this thing. Thank because of Parthada, sorry, because of Parthada, the one man army. Oh, yes, Parthada is a great man. Yeah. I know. And both the program, the array program and cochlear implant program, because of him only. And again, Thank lastly, I give the compliment to you because I am glad that I have been here because it is a great anesthetist. For him, the whole thing has been devoted only on his name. He dedicated the whole thing to him. That is, I very much like that your innovation type of this thing because he's a master class anesthetist. I learned from Bisto and I met him also. Thank you. Thank sir. you very much. That's a get miss for us actually. Good yeah. night, everybody. Yes, we all really meet with the, our brother Utpaljit Borman, who passed away okay. just at the time of this COVID crisis started. Uh, anyway, we'll all remember him and remember him maybe through the webinars that has been going on. Uh, so we meet again on Sunday, it will be a gap after a continuous thing. And uh, hope to see you all around on Sunday and with your active participation. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. you want to add something? Right. Thank, you. Thank you, Deepa. Thank, Thank you, Sarita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Good Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Sanofi, also. Bye. Arun, Sanafi, thank you. Thank you, Rob Sir. I think Arun and me joined together for uh, this great academic fixed. And uh, as I mentioned in my earlier talk, Rob Sir, uh, having a doctor from Bangalore, Mumbai is something uh, great. Teamwork arranged by doctors from Northeast. I would like to really compliment Dr. Gautam 